All right, good morning and welcome to Columbia University and the School of International and Public Affairs, also known as SIPA. I am Sarah Holloway. I'm on the faculty here at SIPA. I teach nonprofit management and finance and social entrepreneurship. Um, and I am a longtime friend of BRC and its fearless leader, Muzzy Rosenblatt, um, and its former board member, Chip Raymond, who introduced us, who's staring at me. <laughs> Anyway, it's my honor to host today's The Way Home Symposium with BRC, which will spotlight efforts from around the country that are exploring innovative ways to tackle homelessness and address the numerous social determinants that drive it. Today, we will hear from four innovators who will talk about their experiences looking at community challenges through new creative lenses and share with us their process for designing solutions that are disrupting the status quo and beginning to achieve significant outcomes for the people they serve. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce you to BRC and its leader, CEO and President Muzzy Rosenblatt. For the past 16 years, Muzzy has led BRC, transforming it into the one of the most effective and innovative nonprofits serving New York City's homeless adults, using data-driven management practices to adapt and innovate to meet the evolving needs of its clients and their broader communities. BRC's 27 programs and over 1,500 units of housing provide an integrated continuum of comprehensive residential and outpatient services to over 10,000 homeless and at-risk individuals annually, helping over 6,000 of them achieve and sustain their goals, which include overcoming addiction, managing health and mental health, obtaining employment, and finding a place to call home. Among other recognitions, BRC is a winner of the New York Community Trust Nonprofit Excellent Awards and a finalist for the prestigious Drucker Prize. It is now my pleasure to bring Muzzy to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So welcome to our, uh, our first effort at, uh, at having a symposium and bringing people together to think and discuss ideas. Uh, today we come together to explore innovative approaches to homelessness. Innovation's become a pretty cool word, uh, but it's pretty straightforward. And if you're here today, it's probably because you get it and you do it. Simply put, innovation is defined as the introduction of something new, a new idea, a new method, a new device. It's not nearly as complex as invention, which entails the creation of a device or a process which hasn't previously existed. No, uh, innovation is simply making a change to something that already exists. The telephone, even the cell phone, inventions. The smartphone, just an innovation. But oh, how radical. How dramatically a simple innovation changes everything. Inventors usually set out to invent to create something that doesn't exist working from a blank slate. But innovators, we're usually quite busy doing our everyday jobs. We're not out to innovate, to change things isn't usually part of our job description. So we come together today to realize our collective potential as innovators, to step back and look at what we do every day, but from a new perspective, to imagine doing what we've been doing just differently and better. At BRC, we didn't set out to innovate. Our story, as you may know, is about our new project in the Bronx where we're building a 200-bed homeless shelter and 135 units of housing for extremely low-income individuals. Nothing new there. Many of us have been doing that for some time. What's innovative, though, is how we pay for it. We're taking the shelter contracts that so many of us who run homeless shelters in New York City have, and instead of paying rent to a landlord, who takes a piece of that rent and puts it in their pocket as profit, they wouldn't do it otherwise. Uh, we're building our own shelter, not paying rent to a landlord, but to ourselves. And so taking what would have been the profit that a landlord had and using it for something different. We're using it to create the low-income housing subsidy that our clients need in order to escape homelessness. This approach offers the opportunity for a radical and disruptive change in how we develop and operate shelters in our city and the ability to use them to leverage low-income housing. As I said, we didn't set out to innovate. We started from our experiences of renting the properties in which we do our work. We need a place to work. We thought we could increase our financial stability and create more certainty around our own future 
if we built and owned our shelters instead of renting. By transitioning from being a renter to being an owner, we'd gain an asset, strengthening our own financial condition. We'd not be vulnerable to relocation and displacement, providing more certainty for our own future. And just as our rents covered our own costs uh, to, to rent a space, so it would cover our cost of operation. We'd be uh, not taking on any financial risk. But of course, as I said, our landlords take a piece of the rent and they use it as profit. And so by being our own landlord, it had created an opportunity for us to think about how we might repurpose those dollars. The same time that we were thinking about becoming, a rent, becoming an owner from being a renter, we were looking at our own data in terms of how our clients were performing. And what we were seeing wasn't very different from what was happening throughout the shelter system in New York. Shelter stays for people who were homeless were getting significantly longer as options for finding housing were diminishing dramatically. Much of this decline in affordable housing options arose out of Congress's sequestration policy imposed on the federal budget almost a decade ago, which effectively eliminated the availability of any new Section 8, the permanent rental subsidy for low-income individuals. Not only could individuals in need and eligible for this benefit rarely obtain this subsidy in order to be able to find an affordable place to live, but developers of low-income housing, like many in this room, many nonprofits, couldn't have the financing they would need to demonstrate the ability to operate the housing, and therefore the pipeline of affordable housing was growing uh, thinner and thinner as, more, as less and less was being produced. We were seeing that while people still were moving out of shelters, although at, at, at less frequency, they were also returning at much higher rates as the places that they were going were more risky. They were renting rooms for cash without a lease or relying on roommates to share the rent, which led to these increased rates of recidivism. So at BRC, we took a step back. We knew that we weren't going to get Section 8. We knew we needed to find something that could provide our clients with the comparable financial security on a recurring basis. And we knew that to develop the supply of more of such housing, there needed to be evidence of a recurring source of revenues in order to support the operation and the financing of the housing. And that's when we realized what we could do with the recurring savings from not paying rent to a private landlord. By taking these savings on rent from a 200-bed shelter, which just on the rent is savings of about $400,000 a year, that is the profit on a 200-bed shelter when you rent from a private landlord. That is about the profit they make after their costs are covered. If we just covered our costs, we'd have $400,000 every year left over. That would be enough savings to cover the equivalent of the Section 8 rental subsidy for over 100 individuals. So now we're about to open that 200-bed shelter, but instead of renting it from a private landlord on a site where there would only be a shelter, we've built it ourselves along with 135 units of low-income housing, and those $400,000 of profits are covering the $400,000 in losses that happen when you rent to extremely low-income people. By not having to generate that annual profit for the shelter landlord, we have saved enough to create that recurring rental subsidy. There'll be 111 studios, the rents will be $455 a month, enough affordable to somebody making $25,000 a year. Those are the people we serve, those are the people who are homeless in New York. So what's our innovation? That we saw the shelter contracts all of us have always had, not simply as a means for reimbursing our costs, but as a means for enable, enabling better outcomes for our clients and for our city. By looking at our shelters and our contracts from this new perspective, something that already existed, a process, a method, an idea that was always there, we found a solution to the challenge of building subsidized housing affordable to low-income people. So just imagine if we took just one-third of the existing capacity, the existing capacity of the New York City shelter system, 20,000 of the 60,000 bets, and we applied this approach. We took those existing contracts and used them instead to create new facilities under this model. We would be able to generate enough savings from that expenditure that is already being allocated and spent to generate 10,000 units of low-income housing from the same expenditure. That's our innovation. Okay, so now for the people you really came to hear and their innovations. As I said, many of us here today have been working to end homelessness for a while, and for the people we serve, we succeed more often than not. Like the healthcare system, the homeless services system heals people. And like the healthcare system, there will always be people in need. Most people go to hospitals and to healthcare professionals, get well, 
and move on with their lives. Similarly, homeless people come to shelters and meet social service professionals and healthcare professionals, heal and move on with their lives. Ironically, communities don't see the two systems similarly. Indeed, communities are as likely to protest when a shelter opens as they are when a hospital closes. Perhaps then it's appropriate and more than coincidental that the innovations which you're about to hear about all arise out of the intersection between health and housing. All also arose out of individuals looking from a fresh perspective at the work they were doing every day. We'll hear about an EMS service in Texas, an emergency room in Chicago, and a state senator in Hawaii who happens also to be an ER physician, how they each step back to look at their daily work from a new perspective, and in doing so, found a new approach, a new opportunity to respond to the need of homeless people and those at risk. A quick word on format. At the end of each presentation, there'll be time for questions and comments. And at the very end, I'll ask all of our three presenters to come together and afford them an opportunity to engage with each other and then with everybody else. Then we'll break for some light refreshments afterwards. But before we start, uh, allow me to, a moment to uninnovate, to be traditional, and to express gratitude to those who made this morning possible. Uh, starting with our philanthropic advisor, uh, a philanthropic sponsor, the William R. Keenan Jr. Charitable Trust, and their assistant executive director, Dr. Dorian Burden. Their financial support made this symposium possible and possible to bring our speakers from across the country to New York, and they've supported our, uh, our interest and efforts around innovation and replicating our success. Our academic sponsor, who you heard from already, Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, led by Dean Mara Janow, and with the support of the director of the management specialization and the global ed tech entrepreneurship program, Sarah Holloway. SIPA has graciously provided this glorious space to us today and the support to make this possible. I'd like to thank my BRC colleagues, Chief Development Officer Shira Fisher, Chief Operating Officer David Tatum, Vice President for Research and Evaluation Robin Gundy, and Program Development Coordinator Megan Tejada, who deserve all the credit for the idea of this symposium and the innovations that we're going to talk about and making it a reality. And a special shout out to our Board of Directors who make everything that we do and I do at BRC possible, many of whom are here today. Our speakers, Desiree Partain, Stephen Brown, and Josh Green, who have traveled great distances as far as Hawaii to share their time with us. Thank you for being here. And to all of you, a meaningful discussion depends on the presence and participation of a great and diverse array of experiences and perspectives. Together, you represent service providers, policymakers, thought influencers, philanthropy, media, academia, and the business community. So thank you all for being here, for contributing to what I hope will be the first of many of these such gatherings, and most of all for being open to taking away from here ideas and opportunities to further the practice of innovation in the great and important work you do. Thank you. Now, to our first speaker. Our first speaker has been in emergency medical services in Fort Worth, Texas for the past 16 years with experience directly on an ambulance, in air medical education, quality improvement, and management. She is the mobile integrated healthcare manager for MedStar and is here today to talk about MedStar's innovative program to decrease ambulance and emergency room use for patients that regularly call 911. Her bio and all the bios are in your program. Please join me in welcoming from Fort Worth, Texas, Desiree Partain. I am coming to you from the great state of Texas. So we are loving your weather right now. We survived our cab ride from the airport. We're doing good here with my husband, who is my audience plant. So I'm coming to you from MedStar Mobile Healthcare. I want to give you a little bit of facts and information about our, our organization. So as Muzzy said, we are an emergency medical service provider. So we are the 911 and non-emergency service provider in Fort Worth, Texas. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Texas, because it is such a small state, we're just to the west of, um, of Dallas, about 30 miles to the west of, uh, of Dallas. We have, we operate 465 square miles and we have about 160,000 calls that MedStar responds to every single year. Uh, our town is rapidly growing and we have approximately 460 employees with over 250 of those employees are EMTs and paramedics that work on the street in an ambulance. 
So at any given time, we deploy about 45 ambulances at our peak and drops down to about 25 to 30 at our lower, lower peak. We work in what's called system status management. And basically, um, that goes off of historical call data. So basically what we're doing is we're taking data from, from previous years and predicting where we think a 911 call is going to come out of. And what we'll do is we'll deploy ambulances throughout the city to make sure that we are ready for, for those type of calls. So that's a little facts about, about MedStar. So what I want to do is start out with some, just some interesting facts about healthcare. Okay, so from a financial perspective, let's talk about the United States. Okay, so the United States has a per, is spending per capita actually close to more like $10,000 per capita. So in comparison to other countries, we are spending twice as much money, which is just insane. Okay, so actually the, the numbers keep going up every single year. What that amounts to is about 30% of the total amount of money that's being spent on healthcare is being spent on unnecessary, ineffective, and wasteful services. So when you put the dollar amount to that, that is close to over $765 billion per year that we are spending on healthcare. Think about that. $675 billion, and that is on waste. So it's sad but true, okay? So this number keeps going up every single year, okay? So it's to the point now where it's affecting our patients that we're serving, and so we're all having to think of these innovative solutions to try and help that spend on healthcare. So I wanna talk about how emergency medical services play into, unfortunately, this waste. So let me give you a little bit of information on emergency medical services. We are a safety net provider, okay? And from, by a safety net provider perspective, you're always gonna have that person, you could probably think of that one friend, who's gonna say, hold my beer and watch this, okay? So we are the safety net provider for those type of folks, for the folks that get into car accidents, for the heart attacks, the strokes, the things like that. Um, when someone is going through what they consider an emergency, because an emergency is defined differently by everybody, we are that safety net for someone to call when they feel that they are having an emergency situation. Okay? But also at the same time, when talking about that, we have, as a healthcare industry, we have taught people how to call 911. So when you go out into town, you see billboards, latest and greatest standalone emergency room. Um, when you call your doctor and it's after hours, what does the doctor tell you? Or what does that answering service say? If this is an emergency, hang up and call 911. When you go to an emergency room and you're treated for maybe a minor injury, what do the instructions at the bottom say? Any of you been in the emergency room? Good if you have not. Okay, so at the bottom, they basically recommend if you are not getting better, call 911 or come back to the emergency room. Okay, so we, we've taught people to call 911. We are this safety net. And basically this is, you know, people feel, feel that, um, you know, like I said, it's their safety net. And um, we in EMS, we have a duty to respond. So if I am out on the ambulance, I can't just be sent to a call and go, no, you know, it's a headache. I'm not gonna go to that today. I have a duty to respond as an EMT and as a paramedic when I am on that ambulance. And the thing about, about EMS, private ambulance com companies, governmental, city, is we hope that we get paid. So at, at MedStar, um, we have about a 30% um, as far as being reimbursed for our ambulance services, which is, which is not good, obviously, okay? So we sit, we cross our fingers, and we hope that if we send Stephen an ambulance or, and he, he gets service for it, which is about $1,500 ambulance bill, we're hoping that we're either reimbursed out of pocket or the uh, Stephen's insurance will pick up that cost, which is not always that $1,500. So 
So let's talk about EMS a little bit. And when we talk about kind of this, the unnecessary, the wastefulness. MedStar actually did a look back, 10 year look back period. And we looked at the number, the total number of 911 calls that our ambulances were responding to. Okay, and we actually noticed a pretty significant um, you know, change in the type of calls that we were running. And we found that over the last 10 years, we were running on more what we call interfacility transport. So these are non-emergency. We're basically taking one patient to a hospital, from a hospital, to a nursing home, to a rehab. So these are really non-emergency type of patients. That number was increasing. We also noticed that there was a pretty significant increase in what we, can, what we call sick person. Okay, so when you call 911, you have a specific complaint. You call for chest pain, call comes out as a chest pain. If you have maybe a headache, maybe you have toe pain, maybe you have a fever, those lower acuity calls come out as a sick person. We were also noticing that we had actually a decrease in those higher acuity calls. So the motor vehicle accidents, the patients that call and they have chest pain, they call and they have trouble breathing, those calls were, were actually going down. So we were noticing more calls in our lower acuity and less calls in our higher acuity calls. And actually at MedStar, out of the 160,000 calls that we run every year, only 37% of those require an emergency response. So when I say emergency response, that means 30, 37% of those, uh, the ambulance will, will respond lights and sirens. And sad but true, but this is the type of patient population that we are running out in the Fort Worth area. And I know many cities throughout the, throughout the United States, you have what we call our high utilizers, our frequent flyers that are quite honestly burning out our system and burning out our paramedics. I got into this industry back 16 years ago because I wanted to make a difference. Um, I, when I was younger, I was watching Rescue 911. I was watching Emergency, okay? I saw the type of calls that people were running. You know, the motor vehicle accidents, the shootings, the, the stabbings. This is what I got into EMS for, right? the thrill and when I got on the ambulance it was a it was a reality check because 90% of the calls that I was running was not the gunshot wounds it was not the motor vehicle accidents it was it was Sally who was calling 911 because she was lonely okay she wanted somebody to talk to and she would go to the hospital every other day so I would see Sally five times a week or it was you know Jan who called going to the emergency room because she knew um, that she could charge her cell phone there and they had TVs up there. And quite honestly, she liked the nurses and the doctors because they spent time with her. We realized that in emergency medical services that we needed to make a change, okay? We were doing the same things over and over and as paramedics and EMTs, we thought it would change, maybe over time people will get better. People will start calling 911 for the right reasons. Back when the Affordable Care Act first was started, healthcare organizations were challenged to really deliver services in a different type of manner. There was, back in the day, there was this fee for service. Okay, so providers were being paid for the type of services that they were sending patients to, diagnostic testing, things like that. When you went in to see a doctor, doctor would get paid a fee-for-service model. With the Affordable Care Act and the implementation of what's called the, from the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, the triple aim, healthcare organizations are now being challenged less about quantity and more about quality. So we want to focus our efforts as a healthcare entity to focus on what matters. What matters is improving the overall health of the patients that we serve. So while we're improving their health, we're, we're actually sending them to diagnostic testing. That actually makes a difference and we're gonna see what's going on with them. We're wanting to improve their health. We're also wanting to make sure that we're doing the, this in a fiscally responsible manner. So we're trying to lower costs. And we're also doing it because we wanna make sure that what we're doing for this patient is meaningful and the patient 
is satisfied. I don't know how many of you have ever been to the emergency room. <laughs> Depending on where you live, wait times are, are pretty significant. So if you are not feeling good, and you are having to sit in an emergency room and wait for several hours to be seen by a doctor who comes in, takes a look at you for a minute, barely talks to you, says, here's your prescription, how satisfied are you with the care that you receive? You're probably not very satisfied. So as healthcare organizations, we're being tasked to make sure that when you come in to my emergency room, when you come into my ambulance, I want to make sure you're satisfied. And actually, healthcare organizations are creating these chief strategic satisfaction um, type, of, type of positions to make sure that they're focusing on making patients happy. So what I want to do is I want to take you back in time a little bit. Okay, I don't want to go with that back that far. But in 2009, MedStar realized that as the healthcare industry was changing, that we needed to also change. Because we view ourselves as part of this care continuum and as part of this healthcare entity, right? We play a role in this. So we came up with what is called mobile integrated health, or if any of you have ever heard community paramedicine, um, where we wanted to make sure that we were, we were satisfying the patient, we were improving their health, we were providing better care, the patient was at the center of their care, and we were reducing costs. So we came up with these programs that we were providing patients with the right type of resources, okay? We were making sure that it was the right time. Okay, we're sending you to this resource at the right time and making sure it was the right patient. Okay, making sure that these patients received the right outcome. So, did we provide them the care that ultimately improved their health? Were they satisfied? And making sure we were doing it in a fiscally responsible manner. And what, how we were doing it is we actually did a needs assessment in, in our community in Fort Worth. And the biggest thing was asking the question, what are our barriers here in the healthcare system in Fort Worth? So we got together with several stakeholders in our community from hospitals to clinics to outreach teams, um, you name it, to uh, managed care organizations. Everybody got in the same room and we said, in Fort Worth, what are the biggest things that we struggle with from a healthcare perspective? And with that, it was, okay, how can we all work together? How can we be integrate? How can we work collaboratively to really tackle these issues that we have? So, and because of that, we developed these mobile integrated health uh, care programs to stop responding to calls that we could prevent. So, is this not kind of a, a you know, different than how we were traditionally doing services? So, as an emergency medical service provider, we are paid to transport people. We're hoping we get paid for it, and that's how we operate. And now we're having to take this different approach and say, well, how can we prevent these type of calls from happening? So we came up with some programs, our high utilizer, which I'll speak about a little bit more, 911 nurse triage. We do a readmission avoidance program. We also work with hospice agencies and home health agencies for hospice agencies helping with their revocation rates and for home health agencies helping with their readmission rates. And it was a kind of a filling a gap in a patient navigation versus primary care. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to take this concept of the ambulance driver, okay? Those EMTs and paramedics that get on the ambulance, they drive me from to and from to get to the hospital because I have a stubbed toe and it's an emergency and I need to go to the hospital right now to this integrated approach where we're, we're taking paramedics and we're, we are putting them out in non-emergency response vehicles and sending them out to patients' homes in order to take this preventative, care, preventative approach to healthcare. So let's talk about 2009 when we first started. Okay, we, were, we took this leap of faith. We had really no idea what to expect Okay, and what, um, what outcomes we were going to be having. So what MedStar did is we started this, what we call a loyalty program. So these were patients who were loyal to calling 911 and using the emergency room on a pretty frequent basis. 
So this list was pretty small. We had about 20 patients that we identified as our top ut utilizers. So what we did was we enrolled them in our programs and, and we flagged them in our computer-aided dispatching center. So when John Smith called 911, he got a typical uh, emergency response. So he got the ambulance, he got the fire truck, but he also had a specialty trained paramedic that would co-respond and make scene. And ultimately we would determine what John Smith needed. Maybe John was lonely and just wanted to talk to somebody. Maybe John just wanted a pack of cigarettes. Maybe John just wanted something to eat. So that specialty trained paramedic would get on scene. Once we determined that there was no life threatening conditions, there was really no acuity to the nature of why John was calling, what we would do is we would clear the ambulance in the fire truck. Bye guys, thank you so much. Uh, you can go back into service, hopefully to go run, you know, a cardiac arrest or some, somebody that truly needs you. And we stayed on scene with John Smith to figure out what we could do for him. Whether it was navigate him to an urgent care or quite honestly, maybe we just needed to sit and talk to John for about 20 minutes, okay? So with that, we kind of, we developed this high utilizer program in which the overall goal is, is decreasing patient's use of emergency services, whether that's the ambulance or the emergency room. So what we traditionally do is we, we refer patients from the, from the emergency room or we do internal referrals. So the ambulance has run, um, you know, Mark 20 different times in the last 30 days. Listen, I am tired of running Mark. I've seen him 20 times this last, last month. Your team needs to do something about this. So what our goal is to then go out and find Mark. We'll set up proactive home visits where we are going into Mark's home and we're doing a complete needs assessment. We're, we're assessing his, his home condition, his environment. We're figuring out what is the root cause of why Mark is calling 911 and going to the emergency room so often. And what we've determined with this high utilizer group is a lot of them do have comorbidities, but it's less about disease processes and more about psychosocial needs. So these type of patients, we do a little TLC at the very beginning. So there's a lot of um, hand holding, but our ultimate goal is to develop some goals for that patient. So maybe Mark's issue is he doesn't have a primary care provider. Maybe Mark's issue is he doesn't have a means of transportation. So he's got Medicare, but he just doesn't know how to navigate himself throughout this, through the system. So let's get Mark in touch with a primary care provider and let's also set him up with some transportation. So does he qualify for a, um, you know, a bus service? Does he have family that can get him to or from doctor's appointments? So what we do is we educate, we proactively help to manage Mark in his, in his issues, create goals, that way we're going in and our visits are meaningful. But at the same time, when patients are enrolled in this program, they're also flagged in our computer-aided dispatch center. So in the event, while we're out proactively managing him in, in his home, because we understand that Mark also still has a high, high prevalence of calling 911. So if he calls 2 a.m. or 2 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon, he's going to get the typical emergency response, but he's going to get that, that specialty pr trained paramedic to go out there and be like, Mark, I just saw you yesterday. What, what's the deal, man? Why are you calling? Well, I, I missed my PCP appointment. Okay, well, let's let the ambulance and the fire department go. I'm going to call your doctor either today or tomorrow. Let's get you in to see him. And you know what? Family can't take you, so let's set up a lift and we'll get you to and from your doctor's appointment. So we understand that, you know, it really takes the patients to be willing to participate in this program, okay? They, they, want, they need to be willing to participate and want to improve their overall health. But we realize that there are certain patients, no matter what resources we provide to them, no matter how much education, how, how many tools we give these patients, they're quite honestly, you know, not, not going to want to do anything to help. So those type of patients, we actually, um, we put them into what we call our system abuser program. These patients do not get proactive home visits. These patients, when they call 911, they're going to get the, the re typical response. They're going to get our specialty trained par paramedic to go out. But then if they call and there's not a medical issue or not an a acute life threat, 
we, we quite honestly can say at the advice of our medical director, sorry, but there's nothing that we can do for you today. You need to get back in bed and you need to go to sleep. Um, so those also, we determine what destination that they go to. So Texas is a delegated practice state, so we have our own medical director who uh, creates our protocols and we, we work under his license and we're able to implement these time, type of programs in our system. So a little bit of data. So in the last five, uh, four years that we've been doing this program, we have enrolled over a thousand patients in our high utilizer program. So these have been either internal referrals from the, the fire department, referrals from the hospitals, and things like that. Out of those thousand, we've had over, over 500 that have graduated. There have been more, but 500 in which we were able to get what we call pre and post data. So when patients enroll into our program, we look at their utilization, their ambulance and their hospital use, utilization 12 months before they enroll. We look at their utilization during enrollment, and then we look at their utilization 12 months after to really see, did we have significant change? Did we impact this patient? So out of those 507, uh, during enrollment, so they're traditionally enrolled for about 30 to 90 days, we've seen a 40% reduction to, in 911 to the emergency room. After they've graduated, we, we've seen a 53% reduction in 911 to the ED, and 76% in reduction uh, utilization for our system abusers. Our 911 nurse triage program. Okay, so who in here has ever called 911? Okay. You, sir. David. Yes. Never called 911? No. Well, today you're calling. Okay. okay. So, David, you were walking to this. This is a new experience for me. This is, okay, I'll walk you through it. Okay. <laughs> okay, David. So, you were walking to the symposium. You tripped and fell and you stu uh, stumbled and hit, hit your knee. Okay. okay. You've never had knee, knee pain ever before. This is the most excruciating pain you've ever seen in your life. I mean, bones aren't sticking out or right. anything. Go so ahead. what are you going to do? Um, I guess call me Okay, that's a great, great idea. <laughs> okay, so David is going to call 911. Well, let's say he's out in the Fort Worth area, okay? So we're, uh, we're transporting you to, you're, you're now in Fort Worth, Texas. You got to, we need to get you some cowboy boots and, oh, okay. and cowboy hat. But Okay, so David is out here in Fort Worth. He calls 911. He's first sent to the police department who determines he, he has an issue that's medical in the nature. So that police department is then going to transfer him to MedStar. Okay, so MedStar has a, uh, a caller who's going to ask you a series of questions. We're going to determine what the nature of your call is, and we're going to rule out any life threats. So David, you, aside from your knee, you have any other issues going on? Oof, good, I was hoping you were going to say that. You're not having shortness of breath or chest pain or anything like that. Okay, so David um, has no life threats. Four years ago, guess what David was automatically going to get? A ride. He was, yes, you were going to get a ride. He was going to get an ambulance, okay? Until 2013 when we started a nurse triage program. So I am the call taker, and I've, I've asked David several questions, and I've determined there's no acuity, no life threats. So David, what I'm going to do is, I'm, I don't think you have an, an, an emergency situation right now that requires an ambulance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect you to a nurse in our communication center who's going to help provide and get you to the best type of, of care that we think you deserve. What do you, how do you feel about that? But I can't walk. Okay, well we'll work on that. Okay, Are, you okay? <laughs> Are you okay with the nurse uh, sure. speaking to you? Yes. So I'm going to do what we call a warm handoff. I'm going to get the nurse on the line and say, hey, uh, Betsy, I have David here. He, he fell, he hit his knees, complaining of some knee pain. And, and our nurse, Betsy, and that's Betsy, by the way, she makes great jam at our, at our state fair. She's an amazing lady. So Betsy's going to get on the phone with David, and she's going to have more of a conversation with David. She has a set of protocols and algorithms that she has to follow, but she can get a little bit more in depth into ultimately determining what resources David needs. Okay, so she talks to David, and we determine, David, you don't need an ambulance. Okay. okay, but I do think you need to go to a doctor. Do you have a primary care doctor? Huh? You answer how you will. We'll go. Sure, we'll go. yes. Okay, you do? Yes. Okay. David, do you have a means of getting to your doctor? No. You don't have transportation. No. Okay, you don't. Okay, so David, let's do this. 
we have an arrangement with Lyft. We can send a Lyft out to your location, okay, and we'll get you to your doctor. I'll call your doctor's office, we'll get you in, and um, we'll go from there. How do you feel about that? Sounds great. Okay, so you, are, can you walk now? Sure. Yes is the, the answer. Okay. <laughs> great, thank you. Okay, so that's our 911 nurse triage program. So lower acuity calls, what we call alphas or omegas, we traditionally would have sent ambulances a few years ago. Now they're being transferred to our nurse, who ultimately determines the best resource. Whether it's giving David simple instructions over the phone about his knee, maybe you need some ice, maybe you need to elevate it, maybe you need to stay off, uh, stay off your leg, or maybe it's getting him to a primary care, to an urgent care, and figuring out if the patient has transportation. So we have actually partnered with Lyft. It's been almost a year. So we send Lyft drivers out to patients to pick them up and take them to urgent cares, to the emergency room if we feel that they need to go, or to their, to their doctors. This program um, is, is overseen by our medical directors and our, in the emergency um, academy for emergency dispatching. So highly oversight in, the, in this program and some of our, our outcomes. So in the last four years that we have been doing this program, we've had over 8,000 calls referred over to our nurse. And the percentage in which provide an alternative response, so alternative response meaning not an ambulance, is about 33%. Out of those, percentage of calls that had an alternative destination. So when we talk about alternative destination, we mean aside from the emergency room. Um, so we have 25% that we have sent to a different resource. Real briefly about um, our readmission avoidance program that um, we do at MedStar. So kind of like our high utilizer program, we're sending paramedics out into patients' homes that are referred to us from the hospital. So these patients um, are referred by case managers who feel that these are patients that they think are going to readmit back in the hospital typical diseases of congestive heart failure, COPD, CHF, um, those patients are referred. We'll spend a specialty trained paramedic into the home, pro do proactive visits, do some disease management, education. They'll be flagged in our computer-aided dispatch center, and um, we will see them for about 30 days, and the overall goal is to prevent them from readmitting back into the hospital. We also provide these patients with a non-emergency 10-digit number, so if, um, if I'm in, in my home and the paramedics are, come out to see me, they'll provide me a 10-digit number and say, you know, if you have any questions, I know you've been kind of used to calling 911, but instead of calling 911 now, if you feel it's a life-threatening emergency, please call. But if this is something you have a question about your medications or you just, you have a, you're, you notice a little bit of swelling in your feet, call this 10-digit number and you'll be connected to either our nurse or a specialty care paramedic who can answer your questions, or maybe we need to set up a home visit for you, and we can come out and check your vital signs, look at your heart, listen to your lungs, and things like that. If you need help getting to and from your doctor, your cardiologist, we can help you with that. You need some, some help with your medications, because we go into your home and we ask you what medications you take, and you get us this big shoebox full of medicines. Half of them are expired, half of them are, are you know, medicines you haven't taken in over a year, and half of them, the labels are ripped off. So that's gonna be one of our goals, is to reconcile your medications, because that might be a reason why you readmitted back into the hospital, because you just don't know how to take your medicines. <clears throat> we also have protocols that we have put into place. So if you are a CHF patient, and you're feeling a little short, short of breath, and you call 911, ambulance comes out, specialty trained paramedic comes out, normally, <clears throat> we would send you to the hospital. If we feel that we can now manage your, your care in your home, what we can do is we can provide you some what we call in-home diuresis. We can start an IV on you. We can give you some water pill or Lasix. We can diurese you in your home in lieu of a $1,500 ambulance bill, in lieu of having to go sit and wait in the emergency room for hours only to be given the same type of treatment and discharged a few hours later. So you, you, you um, get rid of that couple thousand dollar bill and we try to prevent you from readmitting back into the hospital. A little bit of um, data on our readmission avoidance program. So we've had close to 300 patients who have enrolled since 2012, and out of those, um, we have prevented 150 readmissions. So these are out of those close to 300. These are patients that the case management is pretty sure that these patients are going to readmit unless we do something about that. 
So um, we also do a hospice revocation program, a home health program. But overall, all of these programs are really putting the patient at the center of care, taking a step back, looking at it through a different lens, and seeing how we can improve the outcome of patients, making sure they're satisfied, and lowering the cost to the healthcare system. Thank you. Don't go away. So am I on? Good. So thank you, Desiree. Um, so you talked about uh, watching TV as a kid and, and wanted to. So I remember, I'm a little older. I remember <laughs> there was a show I used to watch, Saturday Night's Emergency. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. with, uh, with, uh, with Johnny and Roy. Yep. Riding uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the paramedics, uh, Squad 51. And I wanted to be them. I wanted to run to those places just like you said. So I have to imagine this required a bit of a culture change. Mm -hmm. How did you go through the process of getting paramedics and EMTs and getting nurses to see themselves in a different role and to actually want to get into this? And how much resistance did you get in that process to make that kind of change? So great question. Um, this, this is something we started out small. So we actually started with a small group that we trained specifically for this program. At the time, it was called Advanced Practice Paramedics. They were pre-selected, so they had to go through an application process, they had to go through an interview process, and then we put them through, through training. So they had to buy in in this program and learn about mobile integrated health. So we started small with a small group. We still have a small group. I manage about 20, 20 uh, staff members. Um, but it, we had to, to grow this concept over time. We still have paramedics that are out there that have been doing this for years. But I am big on hiring for personality. Because you can have a paramedic that has been doing this, excuse me, for 20 years. But it doesn't mean that they're a great fit for this program. I hire people that I trust and know that they're going to go into someone's home. They're going to build a rapport with this patient and I'm not going to have any issues. I'm not going to get any complaints. These are patients that I feel comfortable that they would go into my own home and treat my family. So we hire for personality who buy in on this in this program and, and understand that this is a different approach to healthcare. All right, questions from the room. Eve. Uh, Mike's coming around. There we go. Um, how many of your enrollees are homeless? So with how, the question is, how many are homeless? With um, patients that are referred to us that are homeless. Initially, when we started this program, we were taking homeless patients. The challenge with those type of patients is a a place to find them. So what we found was taking homeless patients. It was a challenge to go find them. Yeah, I'll meet you at 7-Eleven on the corner of Hemp Hill and Rosedale. Most of the time, the patients didn't show up. But when patients are referred into our high utilizer or readmission avoidance, I don't have an exact number, but those are patients that we traditionally don't take on, but we're here to bridge a gap. So what we actually do is if we find out that they're, they're homeless, we work with our uh, community hospital who has a homeless outreach program. So we actually meet with them. We say, okay, John Smith was referred. We have found out that he's homeless, but here's where he called 911 last. So let's work together to go find John Smith, and then you guys can go out and manage him. Um, they have uh, physicians, assistants, nurses, technicians that actually will go out and do the medical portion of this. Um, so great question. Hope that answers it. So right now we don't take on homeless patients just because of the challenge in finding them. We take them on initially, but we make sure that we refer them to the most appropriate resource. Jen. Hi. Um, and then Tomaru and then Wynn, I saw. So in, who's paying? How's the paying working? So who's paying that lift bill? Who's paying for your nurse to be on the phone for someone to stay on site after mm -hmm. the ER, um, the paramedics right. go on? And then can you also talk about culture change on the payment side? Because I would, yeah. Absolutely, so great question. So when we first started this program in 2009, we had no idea how this was gonna be reimbursed. It was okay, bake sales and car washes, because that's how it's gonna be reimbursed. After we gained proof of concept, and we started doing these programs, where we started with a small set of high utilizers, we evolved these programs. We did process improvements. We had bumps and bruises, and we bled a little bit, so we learned from our mistakes, 
And then we got to a point where actually healthcare organizations were coming to MedStar. So we have our hospitals in the area that say, hey, I heard you have this readmission avoidance program. We have a readmission issue. So how can we work together to help with this? We have high utilizers coming into our emergency room. How can we work together? We work with managed care organizations that will actually reimburse us for this. Um, you know, home health agencies that want to improve their readmission rates. MedStar is just here to bridge a gap. The great thing about MedStar, so we quite often are here, well, you're, you're home health, right? No, we're not home health. Um, how we make a difference is that we're the 911 service provider, and what do people do when they're in crisis? They call 911. So we have a higher prevalence of being able to find these patients, and that's where we bridge the gap for home health, hospice, the hospitals, managed care organizations, because we're the paramedics that have the eyes and ears to find these patients and make a difference. So hospitals are reimbursing us, managed care organizations, home health, they've all kind of bought into this, this program. Uh, can social workers add any value to this process for you or assist you in any way? Absolutely, great question. So the question was, you're obviously social workers doing this. So one of the things that we're working on at MedStar is not just having paramedics going out into the home. So can we have EMTs that go out? Because the paramedics are just a higher level to emergency medical technicians. We're also working to have community health workers involved in mobile integrated health. Um, so having this wide array of different types of, of resources, not just the paramedics, because it truly does take a team to be able to do this. So absolutely, social workers, I know that there are mobile integrated healthcare programs that, like you said, are, um, are staffing with community, um, community health workers and social workers. And we actually have a nurse case manager that works in our department to help with case management for our patients. Doug? Uh, this is a follow-up with the, the billing question. Uh -huh. You had mentioned about a 30% reimbursement rate on ambulance calls. Mm -hmm. What is it? Is there a similar study you've done with these programs um, as to, far to make it sustainable, the, the program? Uh, so there are several different types of mobile integrated health care programs nationally. Um, that are that are being done um, with a, a ton amount of um, data. The, the issue right now is CMS buying in on this because right now CMS does not does not um, provide reimbursement for mobile integrated health programs. So we're we're trying to tackle that uphill battle because um, they'll they'll reimburse for the ambulance if it's medically necessary. But we're still trying to work with legisla legislation out in Texas. Um, to get CMS to buy in, and this is, this is a, a program that is making an impact. And we are, even though we're emergency medical services, you know, we, we play a pretty significant role in, in that. So I hope that answers your question. Right in the back there. Thanks, I've kind of got a, a multi-part question. I know that 911 services um, can be heavily dominated in the rural areas by private operators, and in the cities it's usually run by their own municipal EMS um, mm -hmm. units. So in Fort Worth, did you actually outbid or, or the contract to win the entire EMS provider, or do you partner with uh, folks who are already in place to try to reduce the costs? Um, so in Fort Worth, uh, we are, um, we're, we're a governmental agency in, in that we are a public utility model. So Fort Worth is actually governed by a operational board and a medical board. And um, so we're governed by, by the board and we actually serve 14 um, cities within Fort Worth for Fort Worth to include, um, include those cities. Um, as far as reimbursement, it's, it's more of the partnership. So we'll, be, we'll work in contract with uh, John Peter Smith, which is our community yeah. hospital that for example, this year they say, okay, we have allocated $200,000 in our budget for the MedStar program. Um, so the hospitals, the managed care organizations are actually putting this into their budget and they're the ones that are reimbursing us for this, for this partnership. Uh, does that answer your question? It does. Can I ask a follow-up? Absolutely. I'm wondering if you think there's, sorry, it's loud, if there is a, uh, an opportunity to partner with the health insurance company similar to what the radiation benefit managers do the triage seems to fit really well mm -hmm. there to try to reduce the cost from their standpoint. Yes, absolutely. Great question. We're actually working with a third-party payer right now 
um, to do more of our high utilizer because the third party payers are noticing that from a cost perspective, they have some pretty significant utilizers in, in their insurance agencies that are using a lot, of, a lot of healthcare. So that is something that we're actually working on and we're hoping to go live in January. One more. Chip. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what, what I'm curious about is it seems that you're taking you know, very um, limited emergency services and medical services and shifting them over to like social psycho services. And when you do that, I have two questions. One is, are you taking the, the, um, the uh, personnel that you have and retraining them? Or are you adding more, uh, more people in the overall uh, provide, providing of the services because it's been expanded and shifted a bit? And the second is, um, uh, do you, do you, do you, when you look at the cost expenses and, and savings, uh, of course medical services cost more than the other kind of services you're providing, but, but do you take into account the, the additional people and, and mm -hmm. services you provide and the, and the cost there, and is there a major difference, or is it pretty much the same cost, but, but very much uh, something you would save time on with respect to ability to go quickly to, to deal with issues that, would, that are not medical? Right, absolutely. So one of the things that we do is this is a separate department within MedStar. Um, so we hire traditionally people that come from, are within the organization. So this is just a specialty or, or a different department um, that, that we hire on. Once they're hired on, they go through a specialty type of training to really learn about mobile integrated health and the programs that we do and the services that we provide. So we do our own in-house in -house training. Right, so MedStar has, um, like I said, over 460 employees, 250 of those being EMTs and paramedics. The, the mobile integrated health team that I manage, I have, I manage 20 employees. So that is within the 250, but we, it's a separate department that we do, um, you know, the, the, the associated training with that. Um, and we also look at, from a, from a financial standpoint, we look at unit hour, what we call unit hour utilization. So we look at how much does it cost to put a paramedic on a non-emergency vehicle. So we've got to look at the cost for equipment and then how much does it cost to pay them per hour. And we help to kind of form our budget around that and to really help us structure our payment model with our partners that we get into partnership with. Um, so how much we're going to charge John Peter Smith to do this readmission avoidance program in comparison to what our budget is. So I hope Great. that, okay. Thank you, Desiree. We'll need that later, but not that. All right, our next speaker comes to us from Chicago. Stephen Brown is a faculty member and director of preventative medicine at the University of Illinois Hospital and Health Sciences System. During a social work internship in an ER, Stephen observed that the underlying drivers of healthcare utilization were largely being ignored. In 2011, he established a program to identify and manage healthcare super utilizers. Stephen is here today to discuss his pilot program, Scaling the Housing First Model, that is raising awareness in Chicago for the need to recognize homelessness as a dangerous social condition. Please welcome Stephen Brown. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Stephen Brown. I'm the Director of Preventive Emergency Medicine at the University of Illinois Hospitals and Health Sciences System. For uh, the medical professionals in the world, um, I know what I just said is an oxymoron. Um, emergency departments have been responsible for a lot of fragmentation of care in the healthcare system. We love to say, greet treat and street, or Gomer, get out of my emergency room. Um, Josh, you're a practicing AP physician, you can relate to this. Um, so uh, I got involved with this project about two years ago. Um, I have, I'm a social worker with a background in IT. I used to work for Motorola a long time ago. Um, and coming into it as kind of a mid-career transition or crisis, however you want to frame it, <laughs> um, I noticed that we had a lot of people that kept coming repeatedly to our emergency department. And there was a great deal of frustration among our providers, among those individuals. So um, I started a program 
about two or three years into my social work career, working as a crisis worker in the emergency department, where we'd actually start to take a look at these individuals. We call them frequent visitors. Um, the pejorative term is frequent flyers a lot of times. Um, but we would, I began to look at what was driving some of the utilization of these health, of healthcare resources. And lo and behold, chronic homelessness was a big piece of this stuff. There's also a lot of s severe mental illness and a lot of psychiatric illness. Uh, and substance, excuse me. Um, and then I moved to the University of Illinois about uh, six years into my career. Uh, having started at University of Chicago. So I was given the opportunity about two years ago to start this program based on some funding that we had gotten from our hospital leadership. I'm going to describe a little bit of it, but I'm also going to tell you about what a deadly condition this is. Um, we're in healthcare beginning to shift the way we're thinking about this. Um, I'll show you some of the acuity, morbidity of the, the disease, and the way that we're trying to think about how to respond to this condition. And then how should we respond? Um, when I got into this program a couple of years ago, there really wasn't a prima facie case to do anything about this. Um, and I'll describe a little bit how our mindset has begun to change to think about responding more systematically. We'll talk about some of the public sector costs and utilization. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we call the wrong pocket problem. That's what Desiree was referring to is that the people that most benefit from the, get the financial benefit from her innovative programs are usually the insurance companies, but they really haven't come up aboard yet. Healthcare is now going through what we call transitioning from volume to value. Uh, so in healthcare, we get paid on a line item. We'll pay for this blood test, we'll pay for that. And there's things that don't get paid for that would obviously benefit the patient. Um, and until we move to more of a value-based system, um, it's going to be difficult to pay for these things. A um, little bit about housing first. I'm probably preaching to the choir, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, and then some of the lessons that we learned in terms of the medical acuity of these individuals, um, the fact that they're invisible in our own system, and uh, I'll profile some of the costs and some of the things that we're doing in the hospital system and collectively in the city of Chicago, too. So this is a question I get a lot of. Why would a hospital pay for housing? Um, we technically aren't, but I've given up on that. Um, <laughs> we're paying for housing. Um, we, as I said, when I started this program, I was uh, given an opportunity to run this program in 2015 uh, because of my experience managing super utilizers of the healthcare system. Um, nothing obvious. Uh, we knew that we had a lot of overcrowding. We're an inner city hospital. We're a public. We're one of two state ho uh, public hospitals in the city of Chicago, and we're also for emergency physicians. Our need ox is always going up. That's an overcrowding score. Uh, we were frequently on diversion, um, and we uh, we knew that our providers were pretty burnt out. Um, they've become very jaded, and the way that translates is if you've got provider burnout, you're going to have poor patient satisfaction scores, because we tend to not treat people very nicely. Um, we knew that there were some homeless, and so when I began this program, uh, we quickly came up with a list of 48. Um, and so we thought we got the problem covered. We had enough money to house about 10 or, I'm sorry, 20 or 25 individuals. Um, but as we got into this, we found that more and more, there were more and more homeless than we ever imagined. And I'll, I'll tell you some of them. Uh, so no prima facie case, uh, but I, what I'm here to tell you today is that for all the people in healthcare, we've got a solution we think that would be cost neutral for hospitals um, as an individual system, but there's a bigger benefit here if hospitals pool their money together into what we call collective impact. So the program I'm working on in the city of Chicago is asking every hospital to pay for the housing for 10 chronically homeless individuals. Now we have nowhere near the magnitude of the issue that you have here in New York City. But our um, homeless population is about a tenth the size. And, and you know, I, um, it's colder, it's windy. I, I don't know all the reasons why we don't have an enormous problem that you all have here. Um, but what I hope, um, hope to be able to convey to you today is that we have all the raw materials. We can end homelessness in the city of Chicago. Um, I'm kind of a class, class half full. 
my wife calls me pathologically positive. <laughs> Sometimes I'm this side of a fixed delusion. But I think that there's really, uh, I believe that we have all the things we need glue and we need reallocation of existing resources. And if we were to do so, as a society, and especially in the city, the city of Chicago, we could be spending about a third of what we do today and have everybody housed. A third. We pay, we're poor consumers. We're paying two thirds too much for what we do, and we do a really bad job at it. So we're a 495 bed hospital, tertiary care, located in Illinois Medical District. It's a very dense collaboration, uh, condensation, What's the word of my density of hospitals? Um, we have Rush University Medical Center, Cook County Hospital, University of Illinois, and the Jesse uh, Brown VA Memorial Health Center. And then within a mile, we have Mount Sinai, it's a level one trauma center, and St. Anthony's, a community based hospital. Very close. Um, we recognized the need that we needed to embrace more of a population health, and that came from recognition all hospitals as part of the Affordable Care Act, had to go through what's called community health needs assessment. So the ACA said, we want you to have a scorecard of what's going on in your, the health of the communities that you actually serve. Now this may not, this sounds like remedial stuff, but this is fairly innovative at the time. Um, and then after that, you have to come up with an implementation plan. Now that you've found all these things, what are you gonna do about it? Hospitals are beginning to think that way now. And it coincides with this, uh, what I talk about from moving from volume to value. We want to be paid a bundle, not a Chinese menu of things that get paid or don't get paid for. We want a bundle because it gives us the financial flexibility to get the services that we need to address these very at-risk populations. And we also, um, there had been a, a randomized control trial, and for all you researchers, that's kind of the Ferrari of research studies, um, an RCD done in, in Cook County in 2007 that demonstrated the effective of the housing first model of care. They provided supportive housing for, I think it was 50 individuals, and we showed plummeting rates of health care costs and utilization. We, um, when we got involved two years ago, the response was very fragmented. We wanted to draw attention to housing first in the city of Chicago. We also, as a public hospital, we have a great marketing department. And we quickly realized part of our mission here was to promote this using media and uh, other means just to draw attention back into housing first. And as our CEO at the time said, Dr. Ghosh, it's the right thing to do. So we're ranked 11th in, this, in the nation in terms of homelessness. Again, ours is a drop in the bucket compared to New York City. Um, and we measure for those that are not housers, um, uh, homelessness is measured two ways. Annual count, point in time. Um, annual count, you can see it's about 125, 130,000 annually. Uh, our point in time count, it's every January, I think it's stipulated by HUD. It's usually the end of the month. People, uh, the, we hire our army of volunteers. Everybody goes out under bridges. They go to homeless shelters, every place in the city. And we need to do this point in time count. Our point in time count was 58, 33. I think yours is like 60,000, just as a basis of comparison. Um, but we also know there's an undercount. I, the new word I just learned last week is called abandonments. Um, we have a lot of abandoned buildings on the south side of Chicago. And this year, we will be targeting going around to see if we can find more of these people that are undercounted. The other thing that this does not account for is people that ride transit all night long. So um, if we look at our EMS dispatch system, the number one hotspot is one is our crisis shelter, our biggest crisis shelter. And the number two is the terminus of all our L lines. Um, so we know that a lot of people are riding transit all night long. Um, the highest concentrations are in the loop or the downtown area. Uptown where I live, uh, we have encampments near north side here. The medical center is located here, so we're in one of the hot spots. <coughs> So uh, for all you non-housers out there, this is a really quick uh, categorization of who the homeless are. The majority of homeless in the United States are, le are homeless less than three months, 80% of them. Um, half of that are family and families and children. 
and half of that number are homeless less than seven days. So the typical scenario when I worked in the emergency department was mom would show up with two garbage bags full of clothes and two kids in tow. And there was a cascading of events that led her to fall off the grid. And it typically ran like, um, got in an argument with a boyfriend, the boyfriend left. Three months later, the car breaks down. She can't get the car fixed. She gets fired from her job, and then three months later, she gets evicted and ends up on her sister's couch for another month until they have an argument and she gets thrown out. Now, someone like that, fortunately, um, there are more, there are decent resources. We need more of those things uh, for those people. Um, and part of what I'm going to be talking about is if we target the very, very expensive people who are not this typical and we reduce their cost, there's going to be more money available for these folks. So if your argument is deserving or undeserving, however you want to frame it, if we take money from the undeserving and move it to the deserving, we all win. I'm sure there's a political argument here. I don't want to get into it right now. But if you want to argue with me afterwards, come and talk to me. Uh, but the, uh, the point is that 50% of these folks are, they've fallen off the grid, they need to get reestablished, and they just need a little help. Because if you don't do that, they're going to move into episodic or chronically homeless. We have guys that have been homeless for 10 or 15 years. And to, when I look at how dangerous the health condition is, it astounds me as a society that we allow this to exist. But this is based on my observation as a medical professional to seeing how sick these individuals are. And I hope to convince you today that they are very sick. So episodics tend to be kids that have aged out of the system, foster care system. 30% kids that age out of the foster care system will be homeless in their 20s. They have a subacute mental health need that has never been addressed. It might be ADHD, it might have been lead poisoning, it might have been a number of different things. It might have been a head injury where they've got a, a traumatic brain injury. But they're not getting the services they need, and so they're in and out. They sleep on people's couches, they have friends, they get jobs, they get fired from jobs. Um, a lot of these people will graduate on to become chronically homeless. When you look at the profile of the older gentlemen and women that we serve in the chronically homeless, many of them have come from the episodic category. And then finally, the chronic. The chronic are the people that we know the most. They sleep under bridges, they push shopping carts. Um, they are involved with a lot of petty crime, but we have very high rates of mental illness and substance abuse in this. So they need a little bit of help, and that's what I'm here to talk. So this is the program that we focus on us in this program because these are the folks that come to our emergency department. So why is there chronic homelessness? Well, there's population characteristics. You can see very high rates of mental illness and substance abuse. What that calls out for is a little bit of help. Um, these folks can't do it on their own. The individual that I know, every one of them will have a severe mental illness, bipolar or schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, the majority of them have been kicked out of crisis shelters. Um, they often get in fights. And it's often a result of being too close to other people. They don't socialize well. Um, they need a place of their own. Um, and then the other thing is we've just had this lack of a comprehensive. We've been working in silos in the city of Chicago. Uh, when I got into this, everybody claimed that they were the voice of the homeless, but nobody was talking to each other. I'm happy to say that we're beginning to move in the same direction. Oh, and then the other thing, we also have the issue of lack of affordable housing. <coughs> Our rents continue to go up. Um, on the north side of Chicago, it's just, um, it's getting very, very expensive. Um, the interesting thing that I find with the people that we work with is they want choice, and they want to be <laughs> safe, the people that, just like anybody else, basic human right. And so they want to live on the north side, but it also tends to be very expensive. So, um, this is the parade of principle on steroids. Um, so among the homeless, they only make 10 to 20% of the general population, but they account for most of the costs that go into the services. And I'm going to show you why. Because all the shifts, all the costs get shifted into the most expensive public resources. The basic problem, uh, the basic issue is, we, as I said, it would cost about a third if we just reallocated the resources, the existing resources that we have. 
So this is all the cost shifting that ends up. So we provided permanent supportive housing for these individuals. It costs about $57 an evening. Uh, but everything gets shifted to the right. And so if you're looking at a day in a hospital, $2,600, that's a cost factor of 48 compared to $57. Uh, what we see now is we're beginning to work together with some of our cross, cross sectors. We're seeing that we see people coming in and out of the jail system. I have a list that I keep of all my frequent visitors, and if they disappear for a month or two, I go to mugshots.com and I see if they're in their they're in Cook County Jail, or I look at the inmate locator, or I look if they violated their probation and are back in prison. And typically they will be. They'll be in for three or four months for petty crimes, for drug possession, uh, for property crimes, for trespassing, things like that. And then they'll be back out again. So um, when I spoke to state officials here, we realized that who they called multi-system multi users were my frequent visitors in healthcare. And so we're working now trying to figure out how to do cross-sector data exchange so we knew who those individuals are so that we can intervene earlier in their lives. So for those of you who are not housers, this is housing first. This is kind of established science now. There's been a number of randomized control trials that shows that this is truly effective. Um, it's a process and a philosophy. It says that people need their own, without the basic stability of housing, you can't attend to all those other things in life. So we have a term in healthcare, we call it activities of daily living. And that's an assessment to say, can somebody live independently? In, uh, in healthcare and housing, we now have activities of daily survival. So if somebody's panhandling uh, or going to get a meal here or a meal there, um, oftentimes that includes them even caring about their healthcare too. So getting them into healthcare has always been a challenge for us. But the way you do it, you have to do it a particular way. It's a generally scattered site. Uh, we do have some projects. Um, Whenever it's scattered site, you avoid a lot of the NIMBY uh, that Muzzy was referring to. Um, because, and we work with a network of landlords that are more tolerant. Um, and we try to give people choice where they want to live in some of the particular neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. They're usually one bedroom apartments, or we have SROs, single room occupancy hotels. Um, and again, they need their own unit. We can't put them in group settings. And it's a third of the income, no matter what it is. So if somebody's making three dollars, we take a dollar. Uh, one of the phenomena in healthcare is a lot of these folks have been in nursing homes, but the nursing homes and some of these other custodial care places will take everything but about <coughs> anywhere between thirty to ninety dollars of their disability check. And um, a lot of people, a lot of these individuals, will not live in these facilities because they don't have the kind of independence and the ability to. Um, uh, to have the kind of income that they that would support them. When we tell them it's a third of their income, they tend to be okay with that. And then we, um, the other piece of it is, this is the globe, the case managers that work with these individuals. So many of these individuals have never paid rent. Um, they need to work on hygiene. They need to get to their medical appointments. They need to learn how to shop. Um, those are all life skills that the supportive case managers so, And the supportive case managers often arbitrate a lot of things between landlords too. And the effectiveness is really high. So a two-year retention rate is about 80 to 90 percent versus 20 percent, um, because they just need a little bit of help. And the reductions in healthcare, depending on the studies you look at, are very impressive. So our program was a $250,000 pilot. Uh, we partnered with Center for Housing and Health that worked with 28 supportive housing agencies, representing about 150 units. The other thing we learned is that we needed outreach workers because we couldn't discharge people from our emergency department directly under this program. And we had to teach our social workers to say, ask these individuals, where do you hang out? So most of the chronically homeless we work with have about a four to six block radius of where they range around. And we just need to know where that is and then specifically any time thing. So if there's a feeding program in a Catholic church on the south side on Wednesday afternoon, that's where we're gonna go to try and find them. And it's worked very well. It only takes us a week to three weeks to find an individual. So um, in our first cohort, we had 26, 27 individuals. Um, 
we reviewed over 60 patients. Uh, four passed away, one violated probation, two were discharged, deemed incapable of living independently. Uh, one is discharged and now in home hospice. I'll talk more about how we break this down. I won't go into a lot of this for you in healthcare. The thing is we eliminated discharge from our vernacular, it's now a transition. Some of these folks will take us weeks to months to place once we've identified them. You have to build a relationship with them and the outreach workers are part of that t care team as well as our internal social workers. So our lesson number one, it's a dangerous health condition. So uh, for those of you who don't know, the average life expectancy is about 25 years less than the average American. The range of death is somewhere between 42 and 62. Mortality risks are astronomical. Um, the mortality risks of these individuals are, the five-year mortality rate is very similar to some types of cancer. It's not the glioblastomas, not the pancreatic cancers of the world, but some of the mid-level cancers where there's moderate mortality, it's the exact same thing. And the way that we respond in healthcare is kind of curious. So somebody comes in and they've had a uh, worst headache of their life, alert vision, they've been nausea vomiting for three days, we will do a head CT, we'll find something, uh-oh, there's a mass, we're going to admit them, and we'll extend their life for maybe 6 to 12 months. Now, if we had similar mortality, somebody comes in with homelessness, they're going to die earlier just like these other people are. They'll come in, we'll work them up, we'll discharge them. So healthcare, we're beginning to respond to, what well, I'm challenging people to think about this as a health condition, not a social condition. So here's some of the things that we found. So 72% of have, have a, what we call a neurocognitive deficit. That, that's things like traumatic brain injury, dementia, uh, people that have frequent seizure disorders begin to have memory impairment. Uh, if you drink too much, you might get hepatic encephalopathy where uh, toxins flood the brain um, and childhood lead poisoning. And nearly 50% have evidence of a severe um, uh, brain injury. Um, it's dangerous to live on the street. High rates of head and neck cancer, um, about 15% of all deaths in this. We, uh, when we started the program in November of 2015, about June of 2016, we got five referrals from our oncology service. And um, they had many more individuals that were in stage three or stage four uh, of a cancer diagnosis. So as I mentioned, we had four pass away. Three of those were in <coughs> oncology, and we have one in hospice that we expect will pass soon. And he is also, I think he had, um, I know he had a head cancer. I can't think of what it was specifically. It's also early onset of CPOD associated with smoking heroin. 60% of crack users had asthma or CPOD, 22% had hold. And about anywhere from a quarter to a half of homeless women report that DV was the cause of, the immediate cause of their homelessness. HIV rates are very much higher and 30% of the population in LA screen positive for, hep for hepatitis C. So lesson of two, the homeless are invisible in healthcare. So when I started, as I mentioned, we had 48. We started doing some data mining. I had a cadre of students, actually students go to Columbia. One of my students now is going to Columbia here, getting her MPA. But we had them do chart reviews all summer long and we began to see then uh, over time that the number has gone up. Our, our current count is about 616. This is astounding to us. When you start looking for it, you find it. And now we're doing some sophisticated data mining. We're doing what's called natural language processing where we look at physician's notes in the context of what they were writing and we expect that the number is going to go up again. And number three, the chronically homeless have exorbitant health care and cost of utilization. So I did this analysis last year of 575 patients who were identified as being currently homeless and then we profiled them by in deciles, intense, of who are the most expensive within our health care system. So of these 575, about 200 of them were in our 10th D cell. So our average patient cost is about $7,000 a year. These range from 53,000 to the half a million dollars. And of the top 10 in this, four had already passed away. 
So incredibly expensive to the healthcare system. In our first cohort, and I'm happy to say that we got funded again in this year, we start our referral process next week. What we hope will be another 25 or 30 individuals. Um, we've learned some things from what we did the last time. Uh, we're gonna be building in improvements. Um, so, um, and we hope to see similar kind of results. Our cost reductions have ranged anywhere from 45 to 21 to 45 percent. Our current cost uh, analysis shows a 21 percent reduction, but we have the one un outlier, the gentleman with uh, head cancer, um, who's now in hospice. And if we took that outlier up, the cost savings would be 67 percent. So why would a hospital pay for housing? Um, I'm hoping you're beginning to see that uh, there's more of a case here than just the idea that it's not worth us for us to do this. Um, as I mentioned early on, we are taking more of a population health approach. So here's one of the things that's kind of a best, this is one of the actual things that would shift dollars to the, be able to manage a program like this. So in population health, we have, have something that's called a power law distribution. <clears throat> and when we talk about super utilizers in any state of the union, every state Medicaid agency has the same issue. Five percent of their patients drive half of the cost. Huge. And the super utilizers fall into this. To me, that's a glass half full issue because it says that I could draw resources away from paying way too much for these individuals, take part of those cost savings and reinvest them as Muzzy is doing with his project that would result in better care, and it's the right thing to do. And it's a wise use of public resources. So healthcare in general, we're moving from value to value, as I mentioned. The community health needs assessment is driving it. Um, and embracing population health. So everyone in the city of Chicago suddenly has been mouthing the word social determinants of health, of which housing is a key element of those things. Um, in the state of Illinois, the state has said they contracted out to managed care organizations. They saw no cost savings. They just rebid and they said, you need to save us money or you need to get out. And so this is, we anticipate MCOs engaging with us. We have had several conversations. MCOs will pay for this, but they don't want to pay for everybody. But if you can point out the super utilizers that have very high cost in utilization, they will make strategic investments. And my role then is to identify who those individuals for those managed care organizations, so they will make the strategic investment. It's also recognizing that it's a deadly social, social and health condition, um, that we should be paying for this because these folks are very, very ill, and they would do much better if we just took a, if we put together a program in a way that would result in them be, being in housing after two years and doing much better than they currently are. I have individuals like when I talk about neurological issues. I have an individual who's 38 years old. Uh, we look for what we call trimorbidity, psychiatric illness, substance abuse, and homelessness. And we try and figure out what's going on. Well, he didn't have a severe mental illness. He's not a substance abuser. Very nice gentleman. But on the interview when I talked to him, he couldn't remember the name of his two brothers, the elementary school he went to, the name of the street he grew up with. And we did a very brief assessment. It's called a MOCA. Um, it takes about 10 minutes. And he scored I think it was a nine out of 30. Now that's worse than dementia. Um, and this guy's 38 years old. So the difficulty with someone like that is the etiology of these individuals, it's hard to determine. Was this an intellectual disability? Was it lead poisoning? Was he, does he have a traumatic brain injury? We can't determine the origin of it. We just know that it's significantly impaired. If you can't remember and you can't plan, how can you, you know, how can you ever get off the street? Um, he's going to need a little bit of help. The other thing is that's really promising is, so um, I'll come back down, hold that thought. So before Housing First, the emergency department, 45% of our top 100, 30% of our top 300, two hour, two hour longer length of stay, uh, contributing to the overcrowding, and about 10% of what we, stay, we, we call left without being seen. It's a key metric that all emergency rooms are assessed on. 10% of those people were chronically homeless, so people are getting up and walking out. 
Um, after we did this, we saw this drop in utilization, drops in costs, and improvement in our provider satisfaction. Um, we find that our providers frequently now point out these individuals and are very encouraging and speaking to other emergency departments, encouraging them to do the same thing, too. This brings me then, this is one of my final slides, um, this idea of an anchor mission. A lot of hospitals are realizing now that it's just not providing just health care. Um, it's health care to the community in which you serve. 78% of the hospitals in the United States are, are nonprofits, and they have to demonstrate community benefit. Um, if you've ever seen a community benefit statement, they can, they, they can be the height of chutzpah sometimes. They're four color, they're very glossy. Oh, these are all the great things that we're doing. But in reality, only about 5% of the dollars com committed to community benefit are really for community benefit. It's really an operating margin thing. They can claim uncompensated care. It's a financial strategy. And there's a number of more advanced community organizations that are now starting to strongly advocate with their hospitals to take on more of an anchor mission. In Portland, there are 11 hospitals, uh, four health systems, um, have committed $21 million. And when you talk to Peter Rep, the CEO of Oregon Health Sciences, he will tell you one of the reasons that he invested in this was because his community organization was reading between the lines on the community benefit statements and strongly advocated uh, for them to do things that actually move the needle on the health of the community in which they serve. And we're beginning to do this now. We just started on the west side of Chicago, the west side total health collaborative. All the hospitals I mentioned earlier are participating in that. So what the big thing we're working on, as I said, is to get every hospital in the city of Chicago, some more, some less. We have a lot of safety net hospitals that operate on very little days of cash. Uh, but if everyone in an idealistic world were to take on 10, we could reduce the number of chronically homeless in the city of Chicago by a quarter or a third. That's, to me, a major impact. And that's a good start. Oh, so what else have we heard? This is my last slide. Um, just got our data scientist degree to do an NLP project. So it's more sophisticated data mining. So we could come up with the definitive answer of who is homeless in our healthcare system, either historically or currently. Uh, for those of you that are academic medical centers, we have a project called Capricorn. It's part of the CoreNet. Um, it's 11 hospitals that are contributing data to a large clinical data repository. And we are walking across that using what we call a homeless management information system. It's usually the single source of truth in any city that tells you who's homeless. So we're gonna walk across this million record thing and say who's homeless within this cohort. But more importantly, for those that work in housing, there's something called the vulnerability index. Um, it's kind of been the de facto standard for years. It's really not based on science. Um, and the authors will tell you so. Jim O'Donnell and Stephen Wang, they'll tell you the same thing. What we have an opportunity then is to say, can we find predictors in the biomedical um, markers of these individuals that would predict early mortality. So we know um, elevated creatinine, that's a function of kidney, uh, kidney function, is one of the predictors. We know that frostbite is. We don't know why. It's an eight times risk, but there are predictive factors, and we hope to then come up with a scientifically validated uh, risk assessment here in the next year, I think. We're doing HMIS EHR integration. We just had a pilot so that if somebody works in an emergency department, it'll ping the HMIS and say, is this person homeless or not? And it'll give us a pop-up so that we can begin to redirect them into services that they need. And then finally, I'm working with a collaboration of a number of different housing agencies. We're doing something called the Flexible Housing Subsidy Pool. Um, this is a la the LA model where I think they built have built 2,400 new units as a result of all of the public and private agencies pouring money into a common pool that's administered by a third party. So this elim eliminates what we call the wrong pocket problem. So the people that most often benefit economically would also have to contribute. So we're having some discussions with our MCOs. And from what I understand, the administrator of this program now works here in New York City, David Katz. Pardon? He's about in January. Excellent. Excellent. Your win, our loss. <laughs> um, 
this, this is great. So we are proposing a very similar thing, starting with a $12 million fund. Uh, the city has contributed had a number of agencies, public health, family support services, OMB, Office of Management Budget, have committed a slice of the pie. We are also then asking hospitals to contribute to this pool and the MCOs. So uh, we hope to launch this in June of next year. So those are all the other things we're working on. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Questions? Thanks. Uh, I'm curious, have you gotten any pushback from individuals who might see this housing program as kind of a slippery slope where the um, social groups start bringing the food to the residents of the housing and the physicians decide it's cheaper to start practicing locally on site and suddenly that you know, word institutionalization could be used because you've you've got all you've concentrated all of these high risk serial users in one location, and you're and you're not giving them a reason necessarily to leave. Is that a risk for this program, or have you gotten any pushback from folks about that? Um, so most of the things we're doing is scattered site. Um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. So well, that might actually partially answer it. You're not okay. picking one location and putting everyone there. Correct. Okay. Correct. What, that, the thing that we're learning, though, is we do need project-based uh, things, but it's a very small proportion of at least the population that I've seen. So as I mentioned, we discharged two individuals out of our program because they were just too psychotic. They couldn't function independently. Um, and th those individuals probably need to some level of civil commitment or a project-based where a group setting where they're being monitored very carefully and they're given assistance with their ADLs, their activities of daily living. But it's a, a, at least from my viewpoint, I can see it's a very small minority of the chronically homeless. Most can, with a little bit of assistance, can live semi-independently. Did I answer your question? Okay. Um, just so in the interest of being able to scale and replicate what you did, um, you put a $250,000 investment. What was the return in dollars? Like if another hospital system is gonna look at this, yeah. There's really not a rate of return. This was kind of missional work, if you just look at it. Now that said, if we look at every hospital taking on 10 chronically homeless patients, we pay $1,000 per member per month to the Center for Housing and Health for all the services that I showed here. Um, so that's about $120,000 a year. If you look at um, the tax benefit, there's now a tax benefit that became available in early 2016 from the IRS that can be committed towards community benefit. Um, and I won't go into all the details of it, but it's, it's a pretty high impact investment for a hospital to say we're actually gonna do something from the community, not only for the optics of it, but also because it's moving in the direction of community impact. But, but what but, about all like the ER, ER visit reductions? I mean, right. isn't there a, no, no one monetized this? We do, we do. So, um, <laughs> I, you know, it, the hospital doesn't benefit at it because it's a butt in the bed, right? If they keep coming, we get paid for it. In a fee-for-service world, there's really no motivation for us to do anything differently. Now, the one thing I can tell you, though, is this is probably pretty close to cost neutral because we looked at, we had two uninsured people on our cohort, and if I looked at their anticipated costs for the uncompensated care for those two individuals alone was about $60,000. So we're offsetting that amount of money um, that had gone in, that was lost money, right? Um, and asking them to invest 120,000. Now, let me see if I can do the math really quickly. So it's $24,000 for those two individuals. So that we just saved the healthcare system, I think $38,000 for doing that. Um, it, again, it, when you bring it all together, I don't think there's one compelling reason like the cost. As a society, absolutely. But when you break it down in all these little buckets, it gets a little bit more difficult. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Uh, quick question. Oops, that's a little loud. Um, uh, for the MCOs, how do you protect against churn and the MCOs losing that, the, that, those 10 members over the course of time? Oh, so you mean they, one system, they go from one MCO to the other? Right. 
Right, right. So we are actually asking the state Medicaid agency to, to create, to every one of them need to invest in the flexible housing subsidy pool. So again, you know, they could argue, oh, he's not with us, he went to this other MCO, we're not gonna pay for him any longer. So the flexible su subsidy housing pool would eliminate that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, so, sorry, I think he's got the mic. mic. You can have next. <laughs> um, earlier, we heard earlier about um, how fiscal restriction at the federal level has prompted some sort of innovation in uh, homeless services in New York City in the case of the BRC. I don't know a lot about homeless services in Chicago, but I have read in the news that the state and the city are under a lot of fiscal strain at the moment. How has that affected your ability to innovate in, in your work? Yeah, so we had a crisis. We had. Um, a little bit of a standoff that has been resolved and the state is now beginning to pay its bills. Um, the longer term issue is do we pay penny wise pound foolish in this? Because again, we could be reducing the amount of money contributed to this issue if we were much more prudent and more strategic on where we invest our dollars. Um, something else I was gonna ask. Oh, uh, the other thing too, so uh, we have applied for a CMS 1115 waiver, just like New York has here already, um, which would allow a reallocation of the pre-tenancy dollars. Medicaid won't pay for housing, but they'll pay for the services that go along with it. So again, we could reduce the cost of the overall services and be compensated for it for the social workers in our program or the case managers or the outreach worker. Those are all pre-tenancy types of services that would, could be compensated under an 1115 waiver. Last question? If there is. Uh, front. Um, I apologize in advance for the, uh, the lack of uh, sensitivity um, of this question. <laughs> um, but I, it, it, with the exception of the people who are in this room, who actually care about the homeless population um, in our community or in our country, M most of the middle class people, um, the, you know, their idea of dealing with homeless is to go to the, across to the other side of the street. Um, and, and they, frankly, it's somebody else's problem. It's, they don't think it's their problem. And I, I think that there's a certain amount of PR that it, 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 it may be done, it certainly can be done, but how do you get the message out to the middle class people in this country that those dollars that are getting squandered on a very very tiny fragment of our population, how do you demonstrate to them that if they would care and maintain this population, that you could bring a huge benefit to a much greater group of people within the middle class because everybody has taken it upon themselves to say, gee, you know, if we did a little better over here, there's a whole bunch of things that we could spend this money on that right now we're not. So when, with your permission, I'd like to take moderator's prerogative because it's a great question, but I think it's something that all three of us have an interesting, three of our presenters have, and save it for the final panel. Do I have your permission? Sure, sure. absolutely. Great, thank you. Right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. The final speaker of the morning is doctor and Senator Josh Green. Josh is an emergency room doctor and has served in the Hawaii State Senate since 2008. While working in the ER, he saw that many chronic health conditions were difficult to manage successfully when patients did not have permanent housing. He introduced a bill in the Hawaii State Legislature to classify chronic homelessness as a medical condition and require insurance companies to cover treatment of the condition. This innovative approach to homelessness would enable doctors to prescribe housing. I'm thrilled to welcome Senator and now candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Hawaii, uh, so the fundraiser's later, uh, uh, Dr. Josh Green, welcome. Aloha everybody. Can you hear me okay? So I, first, just a couple quick thanks. Um, 
thanks to the two previous speakers, fantastic. And I'm going to address a lot of the issues that they did as well. Hopefully it will tie uh, this morning together. Uh, Muzzy, Rebecca, Shira, David, um, BRC, thanks for having me all the way from Hawaii. It is terrible in Hawaii. The weather's awful. It's a, it's a hard place to live. So I'm glad to come back to my roots. I was born in New York. And, uh, and um, William R. Keenan, Charitable Trust, you guys are phenomenal for doing this. Before I get to my slides, Craig. Craig is dead. You all know Craig. Craig died two nights ago. I was on call at the hospital. We have a severe shortage of senator physicians in Hawaii, so I still do call. And uh, he died on, in room three in my emergency department. He is someone you've all spent a lot of time with. He's a 58-year-old, was a 58-year-old until two days ago, a beautiful man, big beard, looked like Gandalf, heroin addict for many years, homeless in our community, uh, went to cardiac arrest while gardening uh, near his girlfriend. And they brought him in. We did the usual epinephrine and amiodarone, tried to bring him back to life. I'd seen him in the ER 40 times, maybe, in the last 13 years that I've worked in the hospital. Uh, just a really special person. He is a reflection of the points that uh, were made earlier today about the lifespan of an individual who's homeless. So, okay. You smoke, I smoke. Public health questions. I'm glad we're blacked out in the middle there because there's a senator I hate right in the middle <laughs> who's killed many of my bills and won't pass some things that we have to do that you've heard earlier today. Um, prevention. Prevention is key. Prevention of an enormous uh, health condition, homelessness, would save many lives, many dollars, um, many hearts, many families in, a, in our state and our country. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the weird road I've had because it, it uh, informs some of the things we're talking about today. So I was flunking out of Swarthmore College almost, 1988. Rob in the back, my best buddy from Swarthmore is here. He's, he, yes. <laughs> and I went, to, uh, I went to India as a, a semester away, uh, traveling around the world, doing some, as a research assistant, they paid for it. On the train in India, a guy came in onto the train with uh, three withered limbs selling food. I thought to myself, I can't continue to screw up. You got to give back. Um, I'm Jewish, so my parents said become a doctor, and I decided, okay, I'll do it. I'll go back to Swarthmore, I'll get my act together, and try to give back in some way. I didn't want to be a doctor that prescribed a lot of Valium in the countryside, uh, or my little um, suburban hometown in Swickley after we left New York, so I thought I'd do uh, humanitarian medicine if I could. So I went to medical school, Hershey Medical School, which is Penn State, lived next to the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup plant for three years. Peanut butter cups are so fresh that you can bend them and they uh, touch both ends. Smells terrible by the end of the day, though. It's, an, it's one of those things that now it's torture every time I smell peanut butter. So got out of med school early, because now I'd got my act together, and went to Swaziland, inside of South Africa, a tiny little country. And we did humanitarian medicine. I did medical missions uh, at a Nazarene church and a Catholic church, where they were uh, at the Nazarene church embezzling all the funds. And they took my passport at gunpoint and said, you're smuggling drugs in, because we were. We were smuggling in antibiotics to treat uh, disease and HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS rate 58% in our little hospital there. So really the, hosp the hospital was what you can imagine, which was an orphanage also. So I started seeing all these things and I decided I didn't want to be a traditional doc. I went to the National Health Corps and said, send me somewhere where I'm needed. I'll go work in a prison or something. So they sent me to Hawaii, of all places. <laughs> Disaster strikes, right? So now I'm in Hawaii <laughs> working in a little place called Ka'u. Very rural though. Uh, it is actually considered a frontier, less than four people per square mile, where I saw chronic disease, lots and lots of untreated mental illness and drug addiction, and what did I start seeing? Homelessness. Worked in Kau in the ER, uh, saw two kids um, dropped on their head. One actually dropped on his head, died. Year old parents were on methamphetamine, which is our big problem in Hawaii. A month later, uh, the parents were passed out on drugs and the grandfather was taking care of the baby, but didn't realize the toddler walked behind his car. Grandfather drove back over the one-year-old, crushed his head. We saved his life. The nurses saved his life. I did a small part. Thought to myself, I better do something more. Um, so I ran for office. Fortunately, I ran against a drug dealer, a coke dealer, uh, and was elected. So um, got married, as all good politicians do. Had some kids, not completely in that order, uh, perhaps. and. Uh, got into the Senate, and I'm here now with you. So 
I had a weird road, and I've seen some different perspectives on healthcare, and that's why some of these ideas came out of a different space. Legislator, um, this guy, Luke, autism, wonderful boy. He was five years old when we tried to start passing the bill. Legislators kept me from doing it. Why? Who knows why? If you don't take care of Luke, what happens? State spends $3 million over the course of his lifetime. He doesn't get any better. You take care of Luke, you spend nothing, he becomes independent. He's a good looking boy. There's his mom, proud, because we named it Luke's Law. Here's a lobbyist who I don't actually hate, helped us pass that law. We take care of people. Same thing applies to homelessness. Physician. So that guy was drunk on the top of his uh, roof in the rain, cleaning his roof, and uh, fell with his saw <laughs> that was next to him. Saw went right through his arm. That's the medicine we practice in rural areas. This guy doing street medicine, this guy's name is Stephen. He's a banker, homeless. Stephen had a midlife crisis, had a girlfriend, uh, too many girlfriends, I guess, got divorced, went to Bangkok, as all nice white men do at some point in their midlife crisis, tried to start a life there, it didn't work, came back, found that the recession made it impossible for him to live the way he used to live, thought the jobs were beneath him, had an alcohol problem, became homeless, had some addiction problems. Every night, he says, look, I read your articles, Senator Green, Josh, I don't want to go to the hospital, to the ER, pay these incredible ra rates of uh, money, but I have to self-medicate, I'm living on the street, have a high IQ, I can't stand it, I'm starting to develop PTSD, but if I self-medicate too much, people punch me in the face, medics come by, I'm bleeding, they can't take me to your clinic because I'm bleeding, they take me to the ER, cost five grand, I understand, I want to do something better. Other little pictures of people that are actually in the ER needed it. So, community in crisis, homelessness in Hawaii. Now, I don't know if you guys have been reading about it, I think it even touched the New York Times. In Hawaii, you wouldn't imagine, but look at that. These are pictures of, of I think that's the Alawai. These are pictures right near beautiful mountains, <laughs> rivers, streams, ocean. In Hawaii, now we have tent cities. Highest per capita homeless rate in our country. Small state, we can't really handle it budgetarily. And from a kind of moral standpoint, we're just not doing a good enough job taking care of people. And so it's been spiking the problem, like it is in your city, all across the country, for these wonderful people that just somehow or other got there. Now in Hawaii, I told you we have the highest per capita homeless problem. We have eight to 12,000 people that are homeless. I was so glad to see this, the slide earlier. 51 years is your average lifespan. I just told you about Craig died at age 58. 51 years. Average lifespan in Hawaii is 81. Asians live forever. My wife is Asian, okay? My kids will live forever. They're half Polish. That'll bring them down a little bit. Half Asian. They're going, they're going for 130, you know? So that's because I put a roof over their head. If I started doing methamphetamine, my wife dumped me and became homeless, my lifespan drops from, let's call me 76, probably I'm down from that 81, I drop off three decades. And we're just killing people. So as I thought about this, I started looking at the problem. I was in the ER, still, um, I just did a 72 hour shift, right? I'm still in the ER full time. I was seeing the same people over and over again as it was described. Rural ERs, urban ERs. I got kicked out of the chairship of the health committee because I wouldn't pass the medical marijuana sellout bill that they wanted. I wanted to work on the issue, I didn't want to sell it out to big spenders, so they put me in the human services committee as chair, which is the biggest mistake they ever could have made because you give a guy like me <laughs> Uh, information and experience and I end up getting to spend time with you guys and figure out how we actually look at real problems. So I actually broke down the entirety of our health care spend and our Medicaid budget in Hawaii. You heard earlier usually 5% of your Medicaid, pop of your Medicaid uh, population consumes 50% of the Medicaid resource. In Hawaii it's 3.61% of our Medicaid population consumes 61% of our $2 billion budget. And some of your states have a $200 billion budget, of course. We are about one three hundredth of the population in the country. Those are actual numbers, actual spend numbers. The homeless population, of course, overlaps completely with our Medicaid population. 13,000 people of our 13,000 citizens, that's our 3.6% of our Medicaid population. We are super blue state. We got 25 Democrats in the Senate, zero Republicans. I took out like all the last Republicans. I apologize to 
my dear friends who are Republicans, who I also love. Not Donald, though. So, 13,000 people, we have a $2 billion budget, so that's the 61%. 13,000 people on Medicaid were consuming $1.2 billion. That averages out to $82,000 per person per year in that cohort of 13,000 people. And there's your number that you saw earlier, $4,450 a day if you go to the hospital. So just to give you perspective, Gary, this is the Gary challenge. This guy is cool. I like him. He's the only homeless guy I found that's hairier than me. Look at this. Very close. <laughs> Gary went to the hospital 241 times last year, to Queens Hospital, our best hospital. His total spend was 1.229570. Incredible. Gary was going into the hospital because he was lonely. He had a crush on some hottie who was younger than him. He had uh, lots of concerns. He's got schizoaffective disorder. Um, he has COPD. He tells me to share his story, by the way, so I'm not violating any HIPAA laws, I think. Um, Gary is just an amazing individual, but he spends $1.2 million a year. And there's a lot of Garys out there. Homelessness and substance abuse. We've had a surge in opioid problem on the Big Island, on Oahu, on Maui, across the country. So in Hawaii, and I'm just kind of setting the stage for what we have to get to, we do a very bad job, and I think this is the case for a lot of you guys in New York and everywhere. We don't treat our addicted folks. 4% uh, of the people with addiction in the state of Hawaii actually receive treatment. 4% of those that are addicted. 51% of all women that were pregnant used drugs, alcohol, or smoked in Hawaii last year. 51%. So you can imagine what the impact is going to be on the next generation. We now have generational homelessness. People just are born into homelessness. We've got little kids. 25% of our homeless population are, are, are keiki. Keiki is the word for children in Hawaii. And then we've got the opioid epidemic, which is going crazy. We had more people last year die of overdose then we had dive car accidents in the state of Hawaii. So you can imagine, these issues are huge social issues that have to be addressed. They have to be addressed because we're killing people. They have to be addressed because people deserve a chance, second chance, third chance, fifth chance, whatever. And we have to address it because it's a health economic crisis. Tipping point, okay, so oversimplification for you people, guys, but I, I do share this with my other legislative colleagues who are mostly morons, okay? So homeless and poverty. <laughs> drug addiction, and mental illness. Now, we're doing a lot in Hawaii, or we're trying to do a lot for people who've just tipped into poverty, and they're becoming homeless. That's about the 80%, okay? So we're, we have a capacity, but it's really expensive in Hawaii, like New York. New York's the only place I come, and I think, yeah, you know what? Prices are about the same. Everywhere else, it's cheaper. So super duper uh, expensive. Rents are, for tiny little places, $1,800. People can't afford them. They become homeless. Everyone in Hawaii, well, everyone, over half of our people are just two months of paychecks away from, if they didn't have relatives, Ohana is the family name we use in Hawaii, they could also become homeless. Now, it's nice and warm there. 11% of our homeless population came from the mainland in the last like, 12 to 18 months. And we're a super expansion Medicaid state. We went from 252 to 362,000. It's a big, that's like a 40% jump just over the, the term of the Affordable Care Act, which now is you know, a little bit tenuous current administration. So we take care of people. That's a fourth of our population on Medicaid. Drug addiction, I told you earlier, we're not treating anybody. It's a disaster. Mental health. Look, if you're homeless for a while, six months, you've got some, you have PTSD. If you're a woman, you've been raped. If you're a teen, you're being pimped out. Um, you're probably being abused in some way or another. No one's going to survive without developing major mental illness. It's just not going to happen. I mean, very few people, right? And then we've got ground zero. Right in the middle, that's the, you know, I'm not the expert, but that's about 10%. And 10% 10 of our 8 to 12,000 becomes our chronically homeless population, are at ground zero, right in town in, in Oahu, in Honolulu. Yeah, they're having a real hard time. And they're spending those giant amounts of money. So, you guys, New York has the same problem. I took some of this from, of course, the you know, New York Times. I'm talking to you guys. New York City homelessness, greatest level since Great Depression was reported. Just what is it, 10 days ago, the story came out that one in 10 New York City public school kids were homeless sometime last year. Goes on and on. So crisis everywhere. I did the same talk in Los Angeles. 
huge surges and huge surges in both from a humanitarian standpoint, how we take care of our people in America, but also how we can possibly handle the economic consequences and still take care of all the other things we need to do in society. The big picture, right? These were uh, counts on any given day. Uh, over 500,000 people in America were homeless. It surges to 3 million at some point during the year. 25% of the population are children, like I said. 15% were chronically homeless. Of course, these numbers are up for small debate here or there, but these are basically the numbers. The veteran population critically challenged, there you go, the American flag. 45% of chronic illness, chronic disease. Uh, the head of HUD actually said something which I appreciated the other day. He said, if you've got chronic disease and you're homeless, you can't get treated. You know, Ben Carson, you can't get your meds. You lose your meds, they get stolen, they get wet. Your pills get wet, you can't take your, your schizophrenia medications. And then the issues with drug addiction. Of course, I'd be doing drugs if I were living on the street, for sure. If I do something, it's terrible, it's scary. Code, okay, so all the comorbidities that exist. There's our range. The cost of society per homeless person uh, annually, our range was 35,000 to 150,000. Average citizen who has some illness is about $10,000 per year for a rough description. I don't know, how many of you spent last year, you know, between thirty-five and one hundred fifty thousand dollars on your health care. Did any of you spend over one hundred thousand dollars on your health care? Our whole population does, who are suffering. Then the homeless patients that go to our emergency departments. See a guy like me in the ER. Thirty percent of all of our homeless vis our emergency visits are now homeless related, which has lots of consequences. Number one, it's the worst possible place to get health care if you have chronic issues or you just have basic issues because you wait forever. It's just terrible. It's also so expensive. $1,024, no matter what, to go through the door in our ERs uh, in Hawaii. $1,050 for the ambulance ride, very eloquently described. Great solution you got. Um, nationwide, there you go, 5% of Medicaid users are half of the spending, ours is worse. Average number of ER visits. So I get called by the head of Queens Hospital, who's a, a dear friend of mine named Art Ushijima. He calls me up one morning, he knows I get up early, and says, Josh, we've got to solve this problem. You're now the head of uh, the Human Services Committee, and you see this, what are we going to do? Our hospital, which is the best hospital for sure in the state of Hawaii, big foundation, is going to crack. The foundation is going to crack because of our uncompensated care, because with 30% of our ER visits from homeless individuals who he loves, this is a guy who's totally mission driven, heart of gold. He just actually can't pay for it anymore. And he has paying patients on the traditional, you know, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, whatever. Uh, services coming and leaving. They're the ones that were leaving because the wait was too long or because they had a problem themselves, a bias against a homeless individual. Or they just thought they were going to get an infection from a guy who had MRSA. They're pretty savvy consumers. He was losing opportunity costs. He had 50 beds a day that were occupied by people he couldn't discharge because he wouldn't send them back to the street because he was crestfallen about it. But that meant 50 people that had had a heart attack or were getting treated for their malignancy or whatever, couldn't be in beds that they needed. Even though these individuals had now gotten basically better, but they had nowhere to go and they were gonna get worse, be back in his ER, still spending money. So we had to solve the problem. Housing is healthcare. I believe this. This is actually treatment. The moment you provide a roof over someone's head, in Hawaii, their health spend drops 43%. 43%. Seattle. It's 55%. LA, 50%. So if you provide housing, if you can find housing, you can decrease the healthcare spend incredibly and do what is genius, what Muzzy and his team do, what the board has authorized to do. You guys are absolutely brilliant. You can actually change your models and pay for the housing. We should be funding housing with healthcare dollars. That's what I'm coming to. Look at this guy. This is his house. A parasol on a beach. Who's going to go to that beach? We rely on tourism dollars. You guys come spend $300 a day in Waikiki. It pays for our health care and our public schools and whatnot. This guy's suffering there. He's drinking vodka, probably. He's hurting. This is his house. And he spends $120,000 a year at least in our health care system. And it breaks our heart. Now, 
here's the benefit. We've talked about some of this already. Health complications. Every other health problem you've got is 10 times worse if you don't have housing because you just can't get better on any day of the year. High levels of stress. That's why you die at age 51. Your catecholamines go up. You have strokes or heart attacks. Basically, we're killing people by putting them out into the elements. There's not much element in Hawaii, but there's an element of getting beat to a pulp or raped. That's an element. Cleanliness challenges. What do homeless people tell you they need? Socks, right? First thing you talk to anybody, they say, just give me socks. My feet are wet. I don't want to get foot ulcers. I get infections. But once you're infected and you're out in the elements, it's very tough. And we have the tropics to deal with. We've got kind of funky infections out there, I can tell you. It is very tough to treat. I have rat lungworm disease to treat. We've got dengue fever outbreaks. And then imagine if you're living without a home. Nowhere to store prescriptions, crisis. Even though I hate prescription drugs in general, notwithstanding those who may be funding our talk today. <laughs> Exposure to the elements, heightened risk for injuries. Everybody falls and cuts themselves. But if you fall and cut yourself without a home, you don't get a laceration, you're repaired, it becomes a hospitalization, becomes a seven-day hospitalization, it becomes renal failure if you get the wrong bacteria. And then you're on dialysis for three or four hundred thousand dollars a year. Big problems. Benefits of housing, 43% savings, like I said. Now, if Hawaii's 1,800 chronically homeless, which is a 15% number, I'm using the 15% number because I believe our number is 15%, we would save $300 million plus in our Medicaid right away. And that's after, after cal calculating the cost of paying for housing first, which in Hawaii is $1,800 a month, just so you know. That's what our costs are to wrap around services. So what did I do? I wrote a bill. This kind of looks like a, it looks almost like a painting now. I don't even know what's going on with this picture. Um, <laughs> classify homeless as a medical condition. Right out of the gate. Stop screwing around. Call it what it is. People want to say it's a social determinant of health. That's fine. I don't really care linguistically. But it is a medical condition if you live three decades less. It is. It's a health medical condition, a health economics condition. I don't know what anyone's going to tolerate as far as the discussion goes. But if you want to save money, here's what you do. You allow healthcare providers like me to pull out a prescription and prescribe housing for chronically homeless. Now, first thing everyone says is, what are you, doing? What are you talking about? You're going to write housing three months? You bet I will. I just told you how much it costs, $1,800 a month. Is that expensive? It's $1,800 a month. Just check out what I can spend if I'm treating your hepatitis C. $135,000 for nine months of treatment in the United States. By the way, it only costs $2,000 in India. Different negotiated price. But I could prescribe hundreds of thousands of dollars of medications really quickly. I could prescribe antibiotic pills that cost $800 a pill. Why wouldn't you let me prescribe housing? It's still going to be vetted. It's going to go through the insurance plan. The insurance, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the HMOs and all those guys are going to look at it. The managed care plans are going to say, wait a second. Green's prescribing housing again. Why? Well, he's prescribing it to those 10 people Stephen figured out really will benefit from housing. Because the moment I do it, what does it do? Say it's 43%, you could spend that money on anybody. Punchline, spend 2% of your Medicaid budget to save 10% against what your Medicaid budget would have spent. Save five times the money. And you house people. I put that prescription out, it goes to two people then. It goes to the insurer and it goes to our housing agencies. They both look at it and say, is this person chronically homeless? Do we have the data? Well, who are these people? Ask any ER doc, ER nurse, or social worker. They know everybody by name. They know their top 300 people in every town, every city. They know these are the people that are suffering most, who have been on drugs, essentially qualify for housing first, and who, if we actually can help, not everyone will avail themselves of the help, but if we can help them, we'll save gigantic amounts, we'll provide housing first and compassionate care, and then we can turn to whatever else you want to spend. If you're in a super red state and you decide you tilt towards tax breaks and philanthropy, that's one of the shticks. That's cool. If you're like a left winger like my mom or my Uncle Wayne who's here, spend it on the, the coolest stuff. Needle exchange programs, treatment for any kind of mental illness or drug addiction. Straight up build housing. But do it because you're going to take care compassionately of people and you're going to save money and a lot of money. Proudest day I ever had as a legislator 
woke up and I heard that both Rush Limbaugh and National Public Radio both supported this idea. Same time, same day, for different reasons, right? Rush Limbaugh said, there is a liberal out there that wants to save money. I love it. National Public Radio said, there is a social activist that wants to help people. The solution was the same. But it was really just meant to deal with homelessness in a different way. I skipped one, sorry. So what did we do? So they killed my bill, or it's in hold, passed through unanimously through the Senate. It's in the uh, House Finance Committee. Uh, maybe it'll pass, maybe it won't. We have to do an 1115 waiver, like everybody else does. I said, do your 1115 waiver and actually push the envelope. Push it to the point where you ask, actually ask to pay for housing. Don't BS around any longer. But they wouldn't do it yet. It's going to take time. There's five other states that are considering this legislation now. I've talked to the governments of Spain. Let's see. Spain, uh, several countries called, actually. The Philippines. Um, I think I talked to the guys in Morocco. Uh, the Brits called, all interested in doing something like this. Because they just see it's a different way to spend resources. It's a group of people that need it, but because it's a health economic crisis for all of society, answering your question earlier, that's how you get the middle class. Some middle class people, Jesus Christ, they're going to vote for Donald Trump. But they also do care about the guy who's homeless or peed on their car or is just suffering or who they knew when he was a child or she was a child. They love that person, but now they're suffering. So they'll do it especially when you make the case. And you've got to make the case big and bold. Um, you alleviate the medical and financial strain on your overtaxed ERs. It's another benefit. But here it is. This could be you and your family out there. Then what? Right? I mean, it's very real. So my guys wouldn't pass the bill and just do it simply as a, as a test. So I partnered with the rich people that I know. And I went to Queens Hospital. They said, we've got to do this. We'll pay. We'll pay anything we can do to help create your program. HMSAs, Blue Cross Blue Shield, they gave me $8 million last week to do this program. We're starting what's called H4. H4 stands for hygiene, first floor. The county bought this big building for me. Healthcare, second floor, comprehensive healthcare, free anybody that comes and wants it. Stay out of the ER, don't get admitted. Housing, I rented the whole third floor for $302,400. So we're gonna put anybody that wants to come in that's coming down out of the hospital, we're gonna make a fortune on that floor not on the backs of the homeless, but we're going to make it because we actually save all those ER spends and hospital spends, fourth floor long-term sustained housing. All these guys were in on it. Hawaii Community Foundation, we've got one billionaire that wants to support it. Regional Community Health Centers, I went and worked in the Community Health Center, my National Health Corps assignment, so those guys are all partners, get better reimbursements. EMS and police, they said, we'll do anything we can to not take people to the ER, but legally we have to if they call, so we're going to call you first. So we got two vans, we made Honda give us two vans. Community thought leaders, everybody wants to do something now that they're aware of the problem because there is no NIMBY anymore, it's everywhere. Everybody in Hawaii is one order of magnitude or degree of separation from everybody else. And then finally, just people who have um, become passionate advocates. And we've got hospice, we've got everybody involved. Last couple of slides, healthcare reform, combating our physician shortages all ties in, it's my daughter. Dressed as a nurse, I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> lost that tooth. Um, I say do universal health care, two year public service, pay for everybody's training social workers, doctors, um, nurse practitioners, uh, PAs, because we do already have a socialized system. It's just called Medicare and Medicaid, putting them together. Actually, treat drug and alcohol problems and make housing a health care condition, and you help save America. These are some of the stats on Hawaii. Not everything goes according to plan. Look, okay? I've got campaign problems galore. But I do know with philanthropy, political will, and positions of leadership, which is you, we can do incredible things. So when you leave here, okay, when you leave here, please make whatever you learn, whatever decent points you derive from the two excellent speakers and then me, make a point of sharing this stuff. We'll give you the slides what you can take and make work in your part of the universe makes a huge difference. You have no idea how many people you touch anymore. That's the way we make this work for the country. Thank you. This is us being rich folk on Martha's Vineyard for free with my uncle.
this is how I look after 48 hours. That's a problem, see? <laughs> but look, I love what you do. And I don't think anyone should despair because I think this next generation, people are going to actually have to find a way to come together and work on these problems. And this could be the big one. So thanks again for having me from Hawaii. Questions for Josh? Um, your, your housing bill, it sounds fabulous. And housing is health care. I mean, with something that we've been saying here for a while in New York. Uh, a couple of years ago, we, we did an 11, 15, New York did an 11-15 waiver, now referred to as our DISRP funds, for almost $10 billion. Um, the initial application was actually looking at using a good portion of that for housing. And CMS actually denied it. Yes. Um, is your bill, is it looking at using state funds? Are you using, looking at, Bringing in actually the, the federal Medicaid dollars also, how are, you, how are you looking at that? I think what we do is it should be the federal dollars. Although I am indirectly using state dollars, we're doing the state waiver. It is possible that we'll get approved. It's a really interesting thing because we know that we could save 43%. What did the feds say they were gonna do with block grants, which are evil? They were gonna decrease us by 40%. What does um, Brent James say, just recently left, I think, uh, the organization, Intermountain Health, we could say 45% on healthcare. These numbers are not a coincidence. I don't want them to cut our budgets 45%, but the realization that we can shrink certain expenditures by about that amount makes it so compelling that eventually, I think, as we hit our next crisis, whatever that budgetary crisis uh, circumstance might be nationally, it'll be an opportunity to do it. Amazingly, Ben Carson, I'll mention him twice now, as scary as that may be, said the same thing. Basically, he presented this concept saying that we could save a lot of money and, and, and do it in a good way for people. So I think it should be federal. I think that if we make the compelling, for this administration, economic argument, then we can make the social arguments at the same time and do it. I, because I'm very restless, as you can tell, I decided I would just use the private sector. So what I'm doing is I'm spending $8 million to save $40 million in my own state's Medicaid budget in the next year. That eight million is coming from the insurer. We have basically a monopoly uh, where we have just one insurer for the whole state of Hawaii, Blue Cross Blue Shield, HMSA. And I'm proving the point straight away with really good data, all the best uh, agency types, and then saying, hey, how can you not do this? So we're going to prove it back end first because they wouldn't just straight up give us a trial. Maybe some states will get a trial. I would not be shocked if some of the innovations grants will start allowing this. Also, what they're now talking about, right, is um, for the 1115 waivers, giving full wraparound services. So the moment you take those costs off of the state, then you just, it's whittled down just to the housing component. Sometimes you can get the philanthropic community to pay for the housing because they didn't now have to pay for the wraparound services that they might have been giving us big grants for. So it's kind of a tricky way that we might get to the same result. Over here. Okay, so I ask this not because I'm concerned about it, but it's just that people always bring this up when you talk about homelessness. Um, so making housing a medical issue so you could prescribe it, how do you deal with people who are then drawn into the system who might have other options, but because there is this benefit, they, take, they make use of it? Brilliant question. So, so in Hawaii, the question, did everyone hear the question, how do you keep people from abusing the system or taking advantage of what is, would seem to be a very generous offer? Well, first of all, again, we know very clearly who are the chronically homeless. This, this is not meant to be prescribing housing for all the homeless individuals. It's meant for the chronically homeless, right? Uh, in Hawaii, we have a lot of 25-year-olds out there that you could probably characterize as homeless. They're living out of a van. They're making some choice for their lifestyle for a period of time. Uh, they wouldn't qualify because we will be very careful. Just like we vet uh, when we do prior authorizations, much to my dismay as a doctor half the time, they go through a real rigorous process when the cost is high. This cost is going to be eighteen to twenty-five thousand dollars per year, essentially for this prescription. So it'll be vetted very carefully. Not everyone will get it. There will be the regular criteria. If you blow it, like if you are on the liver transplant list and you start boozing up again, that's it. There's no second liver, right? Or you get knocked off the list. There's probably going to be some moments, but we have to be much more forgiving because, as described earlier, 
our homeless population, especially those with mental illness or drug addiction, have object permanency problems. They can't remember what they were supposed to do four hours ago, right? So they've been traumatized. They have traumatic encephalopathy. They've got all these health problems. So we'll have to be careful. But even if you cast the widest, uh, most generous net, you can't miss because everybody's going to the ER. And if they go to the ER, it costs three grand by the time it's an ambulance and a visit. And God help you if I admit somebody out of sympathy for in a day just to try to chill them out. That's another $4,000. That's $7,000 now that I could have spent five months taking care of somebody. So the target is so good that, yeah, we'll miss a little bit, maybe, but we'll help a lot of people. All right, let me invite Desiree and Steve and Josh to sit down. I, I, find, my, I find myself asking uh, Desiree, how did you get out of the gate? How was that first year? Was it just a leap of faith where you had some you had personnel and a commitment? Or did you already have um, partners that were ready to jump in? So what we did at MedStar is we, um, as I spoke about, we did a needs assessment in our community. So we really got together with some of the leaders in healthcare, some of the different resources in the community, the hospitals, the managed care organizations, the clinics, um, you know, you name it, we, we got with everybody and really decided what were the biggest gaps in the community. So it was our high utilizer population, it was our readmissions, um, you know, that we really kind of identified our top three that we wanted to, to tackle. And from there, we first started with our high utilizer population. And we had to, you know, everybody has great ideas and you, you have all these great thoughts, these huge thoughts, but you really have to start small. So that's when we started our program, we identified our top 20, and it was just a making sure that we studied this group for a while, so we so that way we could get the data to support because it's all about data right now in healthcare, right? So we used that small group in order to do this proof of concept where we gathered data and we really showed over time that look, we had these 20 people that were calling 911 on a frequent basis, and here's how much it costs to the healthcare system. But when we stopped sending them by ambulance to the emergency room and here's where we were navigating them through the healthcare system after one two years here's the impact that it had financially which not only impacted the ambulance organization but impacted the hospitals impacted the clinics impacted transportation and that was the buy-in that we got in order to prove this this value for for the programs that we were doing and then they started paying after that because and, they saw it work? And they did, but you, in order to do this, you, you have to have the data to support it, the financial impact. You can't just go in and say, hey, this sounds like a great idea. We had to go in and say, look, we stumbled for about two to three years with this, but here's the data that we have to, to support how, why this is a very valuable program. I might add to, uh, Josh, I love your approach to this because I get caught in the weeds a lot of time. Um, and I'm working from the inside out, and you're working from the outside in. And when you work in this space, the great thing is there's always opportunity for discontinuous innovation. Um, somebody will say one little thing in a meeting and you realize that you totally need to reframe the way that you're thinking about things. So the idea of that, yeah, housing is healthcare. It seems like a basic human right and a lot, not a lot of people would agree with me on that, but the idea that if you could legislate this in, it would force a, a, a different way of thinking about this that everybody would benefit from. And um, yeah, so uh, I, I just love what you're doing. Well, you know, it's funny, <laughs> about, the one funny thing about that was, you know, think, think about it, okay, the word housing. Yeah, it's different than amoxicillin, it's different than um, ribavirin, but what difference does it really make if somebody lives longer and the costs come down on their health? What, what difference does it really make? to an insurer that's gonna pay it anyway, to a society that's gonna to have to pay their taxes anyway. Right. So sooner or later, we're gonna get there. And by the way, that wasn't, housing is healthcare, really what happened was we were, I was being all wonkish about it, and my um, social media guru who's like nine years old, right? She, uh, <laughs> she wrote down on a note, housing is healthcare, damn it. And that's, 
That became the simplified version of it. Hashtag, of course. Hashtag. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's go back to the question that, uh, that we put on, on the shelf from Wynn. Um, and I may uh, uh, add a corollary to it, which is um, how do we get outside this room people to actually care about the people we serve and the work we do and, and, and the things that we've been talking about today? And, and I guess I append to that is do we need get, to get people to, to care in the kind of emotional, communitarian way that I think Wynne was implying? Or is it just, on the data point, is it just a practical dollar and cents and, and be self-interested and, and, and there's not a need to get people to care? Mm. Um, to your question, uh, so there was a series, it was, I think it was called Together We Rise, and it was about the AIDS epidemic that started in the 70s and 80s, and it followed a number of advocates here in New York City. Guy Pierce played the lead. But what turned that movement around was when people began to recognize that it was their sons and daughters, the folks that you spoke about, and that it personalized of, uh, what was kind of perceived as being a marginal populations issue, right? And what you see oftentimes is we just, we have an encampment, we had two encampments under Wilson and Lawrence Avenue and they dislocated them because they needed, rede needed to redo the bridges. It was, and now they're gonna decrease the sidewalk length so those people will not be able to move back in. The stories that you hear from those individuals are people that were like the people that you described, were one paycheck or two pay checks away from falling off the grid. So a lady with had, uh, had been a receptionist and got laid off, lost her health insurance, was on dialysis, um, now is in a walker. This is somebody that was incredibly functional, no mental illness, no substance abuse, none of those issues, but was one step away from catastrophe that ended up homeless and those things. And I think that's part of the advocacy of this too, is that everyone is vulnerable. That's part of this as you yeah. described, that yeah. individual. Yeah, and more, even more than that, I would say, um, I, I think it will fall into, like everything, it will be on a curve a little bit. So some people will realize that it's the humanitarian thing to do, period. Those, they're not so hard to convince. Um, but everyone also has a certain threshold, right, that they can tolerate. Even the most you know, strident advocate from our own organizations, we reach a crisis some days. We're exhausted or, our, like in Hawaii right now, we just had to close um, one of the most popular beach parks. And that is raising incredible awareness. And now all of a sudden, everyone's interested in my project and supporting it, and they're saying, oh, that's a place that those two or 300 people could benefit, get somewhere to stay, get some cheaper healthcare. They learn the other things. Some people might pivot to the economic question, but that might be the catalyst. It, you just never know. But I will say this, it's much easier to share information than ever before. When I ran my first campaign, it took me seven months to reach 12,000 people in person. Now, it takes me seven seconds to reach 100,000 people. So, and that's just 13 years later. And that means if we have a good idea, if we can put the right info or the moments, I still think it's the emotional stories that get people the most engaged, then sky's the limit. Yeah. Um, I went to dinner with some dear friends of my wife that live in the North Shore. Um, very blue area of the state and um, describing the work that I was doing and um, a friend of a, my wife said, well, they're gonna get jobs, right? Um, and I said, well, some will, we'll try, but um, it, regardless of whether they get jobs, it's gonna be about a third, it, it's gonna cost us two thirds left if we just give them a place to live. And to her, that was okay. It was like, oh, okay, it's gonna be cheaper for us too. Um, and you just, the other thing too that is that generally when I get approached a lot, it's usually on the individual response. What do I do? Do I give them a dollar? Do I not give them a dollar? And I think that's a, we need to reframe that into more of what you're doing is point people towards these societal issues. And, and we're not doing a very good job of it to say, here's the three things as a society we need to do um, so that they can plug into and they can influence their legislatures to do the right thing. Because right now we have a very fragmented response of the way we think about this. And we need to give them the infographics, the three bullet points, so that they as citizens can be empowered to get their legislators to do the right things. Not, I, I think we need to move beyond the individual response. I think that's important. I think it's that we treat everyone with dignity and respect and we look everybody in the eye and we treat them very politely. Those are all givens. But beyond that then, we need to give them, empower them to ask their legislators to do the right thing too. 
Uh, let's turn it over to the audience. Um, Larry, I see. Um, You'll have to speak up because I yes. just stole the microphone from you. One of the issues of the healthcare debate is that is, is healthcare insurance costs. Would one argument be that this would, by reducing all these healthcare costs, reduce healthcare insurance costs and premiums and all that? Yeah, okay, so uh, to restate the question, uh, one of the arguments would be you could save on healthcare costs, right? If you, you could decrease premiums if you got better care for people. Um, well, look, for our population, it's very evident that we are spending so much money on a small percentage of people, what happens? There's just cost shifting. So the middle class who are, Hawaii is interesting. We have a thing called the Prepaid Health Act. 1974, we passed a bill, I was four years old, uh, so long before me. They did great work because they said anyone who works 20 hours or more gets health insurance in Hawaii, mandate. So everyone's insured, essentially, in Hawaii. And then you added the Affordable Care Act and the last bits of people got insured. But because we're spending an average of $82,000 per person per year on our high utilizers in Medicaid, we have to pay a lot of extra tax dollars. One out of every $6 in Hawaii goes to Medicaid. One out of six. So the moment we say we're going to make the system actually work, whether it's housing solution or prevention of hepatitis or whatever, we can decrease that amount of money that everybody else is paying into pretty high taxes in Hawaii. There's your sale point or the businesses who pay for all the rest of insurance because we have a business employer mandate, they are, their price points are not tolerable anymore. They, when they got up to $400, $450 per person, per employee, per month, they themselves said, we don't know if we can sustain that growth, we can't raise our prices that much more. So everyone has a threshold. The moment we tell them we can decrease Medicaid costs by 20, 30, 40%, everyone's gonna celebrate because then the private sector guys don't have to make up for that. So we find interesting allies all, all across the spectrum, some of whom are very, very fiscally conservative, but they end up supporting a social initiative or a set of social initiatives because of the economic positive consequences on their part of society. So another uh, hand over here. Yeah, I, gonna have to be I, wanted, I wanted to ask about uh, I guess what they call it, social impact investing. I mean, during the Bloomberg years here in New York, there was, I remember talk of they were going to have social impact bonds that you could invest in the discharge planning for inmates coming out of Rikers. And that the investors would, if there was a savings, the investors would get some of that as a profit. So it just seems like all these initiatives are for social impact, getting the investor class interested in putting up money, and then they would reap some of the savings as profits. That, Actually, I just checked the Goldman Sachs website. They have uh, social investment. They have an initiative in Chicago of pre-K. Yeah, so we had a very successful program. So the autistic young man you spoke about. So that investment in upfront saved a lifetime of cost. I forget what the numbers were. $3.1 million. Right. So we did a very similar program with the Pritzker Foundation and Northern Trust and Goldman Sachs where we invested in pre-K kids that were generally referred into special education but received early intervention and it, provide, it prevented a lifetime of excessive cost because a lot of these kids didn't need to be the program if they got early intervention. So um, Pennywise, Pound Foolish, right? As you say, and that's what we're looking at, so part of what we're doing as part of our collaborative is getting the banking industry, because if you think about this, there are a lot of people that would invest in these programs if they knew they were going to say, if they've saved money, um, they're not necessarily voracious capitalists, but people that have a want to get some rate of return, a modest rate of return, but also do a greater impact. So we are t um, talking about some of those things. I wish we were farther along with it. Um, what we need, what we tend to do in healthcare and housing is we try to push these things out. And I've, we've learned that we can't be subject matter experts in everything. And so what we're doing now is trying to elicit help from the banking and finance industry because but investors are always looking for new markets, and this is a perfect opportunity for investors to come into it if we had like a Goldman playing the underwriting role in social impact. So yeah, those are tremendous, uh, there's a tremendous potential to do more of these types of projects. I'd love to see that with your program too, uh, because you are saving so much money uh, over the long term of the program. Yeah, Muzzy's doing it already too with his program, right? I mean, he's doing it essentially. You know, it's a different variation. It's an innovative part of that program, but I mean, I was on the plane, I got lucky enough because I have like gazillion Hawaiian Airlines miles, so I upgraded, you know, and I'm sitting next to the senior VP of Goldman. 
I was sleeping <laughs> next to them, and, uh, and there they are. We're talking about this thing. And sure, not only do they have foundations, but they could repopulate their foundation monies if they invest. Like, um, Queens Hospital has a billion dollar trust, and they're willing to do anything in Hawaii, but they still have to go back to their board and say, okay, did we just plunk down 40 million for that program and it's gone? Or maybe that 40 million is gonna bring back 45, and then they got the extra money. So I think it's brilliant what you say. Final question, Yeah, I, I'm looking at that in my mind, at your Venn diagram with your ground zero folks, and I was thinking as I was looking at that of another circle, and that is the criminal justice piece. And, and the dollars you know, that are shifted into criminal justice that these kinds of initiatives would also um, address if you could take, if you could tap into some of the dollars and the savings on the criminal justice side uh, to, to, to fund and, and to bring dollars into the healthcare side. And not just savings on criminal, uh, the, the monetary savings, but what happens right now in our criminal justice system from a health standpoint, for instance, is we don't provide almost any healthcare in our state in our prisons. They get like virtually nothing. And they get sicker and sicker and sicker until they basically die. Um, so we could actually then have resources. We might still just be break even, but we could take better care of people. But yeah, that, that doesn't even scratch the surface. That $82,000 per person per year doesn't even scratch the surface of what the actual cost is because those individuals are suffering, their children are in poverty. Uh, many, a great percentage of those individuals have all the problems we have. Otherwise, they might have autism and they now are also homeless. And then there's a great capacity for mayhem that goes on in society, which has incredible cost too. So these things keep steamrolling, we should steamroll it backwards. Steamroll it backwards, we might actually have a society that works. I just came from a conference, the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, and there was a number of sheriffs from some of the mid-sized city and cities in uh, Illinois. And the sheriffs, all, they had this peculiar, particular phrase, they said, because uh, every one of them was faced with a referendum to ask for more money for more beds, jail beds, and they had been voted down two or three times. And so they began to look into their populations and they said there were two types of populations, those that were afraid of and those that were mad at. Right. Those that were mad at are really the people that are suffering with psychiatric illness and substance abuse and homelessness. And so they are now looking at more diversion programs. Could we move them out of them? And I see this all the time, the recidivism. So of the 27 that we refer to, 17 had criminal justice, uh, mostly petty things. There was two people that had violent crimes that had gone to prison for some time. The majority of them had misdemeanors that had been in and out, secondary to the fact that they were homeless. And they had done trespassing, they'd done petty crimes, you know, things like that. So um, I think in Santa Clara County um, in California, they categorized all the health care, the, the potential for cost savings. So 53% of the potential cost savings would come out of health care. 35% would come out of the criminal justice system. So, and first responders, so police, fire, jail, j uh, courts, and then another 15% in social services. So as you said, we haven't even scratched the surface in being able to articulate what the total state would be if we did a better job of managing this population. So we're gonna conclude now. Um, I think what's been uh, I'm grateful for all of you coming. I'm grateful for all of you being here and the conversation we've had. Um, you know, as we think about innovation, all of the things that we've been talking about, no one once has said we need more money, that we need to do more of something, that, or that we need to do more of something that we're already doing. We've all come to this looking at what we do already and seeing the inefficiencies and seeing the suffering and seeing the pain that comes of traditional ways of working and looking at the resources we have and how better to reallocate them. At the same time, I think we've all gone through an experience of realizing that just seeing it for ourselves and seeing the opportunity there isn't enough, we have to convince others. The world we work in, by necessity, operates in silos or structures. Things have to be organized. And the only way that we're going to break through those silos is through communication and building bridges. Um, that's what we were able to do with our project and that's what some of you have been able to do is to not just speak our own language and convince ourselves of the, of, of, of the goodness and the, of the work that we do, but of the value and the opportunity um, that there are financial models, that there are savings, that there are ways to bring in others who might not traditionally think about this work, who might not necessarily care about the things we do, people who have made other choices, 
but nonetheless see opportunities. Opportunities for savings, opportunities for impact, opportunities for efficiency, opportunities for success. And so I think it's incumbent on all of us not just to keep talking to each other and to ourselves, though I do that a lot, um, but to reach beyond this room and to reach into those other silos of finance, of bureaucracy, and see in them not the enemy, but the ally, and have those conversations and help people see what we do. Um, so I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank Josh and Stephen and Dorian for, uh, Desiree, for uh, coming as far as they have and to share their experiences with us. We're going to have a reception out those doors afterwards. Restrooms are out there as well. You've been very patient and very good. Uh, and, um, and we'll have an opportunity to have some informal conversations. Thank you all very much for sharing this first experience with us and for making it such a success. <laughs>